YouTube. It says going live, but uh, you don't know whether that means you're live. All right, it says we're live. Introduce yourself. Hi, my name's Stefan Levera. I'm known as a Bitcoin podcaster. I'm particularly known for bringing a specific Austrian economics angle to the way that I conduct the interviews. And he just dropped out. <laughs> no. And All right, hold on, hold on, hold on. Well. You dropped out for a second. We left off with you saying you bring a specific angle to your podcast, an Austrian angle. And then you drop. Sure. Out. Yeah. So, yeah, my my podcast is mainly known for coming from a what I call a Bitcoin Austrian view. I essentially came from that point of view because I was into Austrian economics even before getting into Bitcoin, and so that's where I took some of my intellectual influence. And so for me, I'm I would say in a similar school of thought to people like Safety and Amus, Pierre Richard, VJ Boyaparty, Michael Goldstein. I'm from a similar to, to some extent, I, well, that's, I'm known as uh, interviewing from that perspective. Okay, cool. Uh, but also conducting more of a technological interview style as well around, you know, specific technical components of Bitcoin. Great. Well, let's, uh, let's have at it. What, do you have anything you'd like to talk about in particular? Do you know who I am? Do you, do you, do you know of me? Should I introduce myself? Yeah, no, I do. I do know of you, Richard. Um, uh -huh. I, I think you're one of those guys who's like, obviously you're quite intelligent and you've got a good way of speaking and so on. But I, I, I guess I, I do have a bit of a concern around this whole Bitcoin hex thing. You know? Great. I, I, yeah, I, I think it, 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 it just leads people the wrong way. It, it tells people, Oh, Hey, we can create this new money. And well, this is going to be know, an awesome conversation. Like, I can feel it. It's yeah, awesome. yeah, for sure. I'm happy to yeah. happy to discuss back and forth. Yes, yeah, so I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, yes, we, we can create money out of thin air. Continue. Yeah, so I, I, I just see it like, what what is even the point of this? Uh, yeah. Is it just kind of giving people the wrong idea of, oh, hey, we can try to create a coin that's intentionally meant to pump or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so so let me, me so I'll, I'll try something. Yeah, sure. I'll try something different, right? my audience has already seen me say the same things a lot. And so I'd like to see, let them hear me say new things. So I'm going to try and say new things with you. Um, and we'll try this more of a, a Socratic questioning and interrogative type of interaction where I elicit your worldview and your values and beliefs, and then see if in, in fact, mine kind of fits into yours and we just didn't realize it. And that we actually have, you know, synergy and such. So, you know, why do you like Bitcoin? Fundamentally, it, re it represents a game changer technology. It mm -hmm. represents the ability to create hard money, right? Money that's hard to create, mm -hmm. that is outside the purview of any government or any company or any person, while at the same time being programmable and able, you know, abil the ability to be sent anywhere I think another key component that I really like about Bitcoin and why I view it like a very game changer level technology is that people can cheaply verify it. So you can run a Raspberry Pi full node and the, the parts for which will cost you maybe two or $300 <clears throat> and you can now verify the full supply, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, as I'm sure you're aware. And so to me, that just represents a real change in the way that money could be created and operated. And I mm -hmm. would contrast that with gold, right? So mm -hmm. gold for a long time, for thousands of years was money. However, it got centralized and that is how it got co-opted by the government. And that how that is how I would say gold got so demonetized. Let, so let me yeah, jump in because I don't, I want to. So I agree with almost everything that you've said. Um, there's certain caveats that I would insert in there. Um, I guess since you know, your podcaster and used to going in depth, I will go in depth with you at this point. Um, so I agree with you that a technology that can truly change the relationship of man and government is a huge, huge, gigantic thing. And there really aren't that many of, of those technologies out there that you could participate in. And the fact that you could participate in it and get rich at the same time is just even better. Right. Um, as far as verifying the whole supply and running a full node, 
in fact, running a full node is meaningless unless you trust who you downloaded it from. And so in reality, all of blockchains, all blockchains are socially enforced networks and you downloading a client that you think is a full node and you think is doing things better than a soft client or a thin client. That's only true if the person that gave it to you didn't malware it and just take all your keys, right? And so unless you're actually a developer reviewing the code textually, looking at the lines of text, compiling it yourself into your own executable and then running it yourself and then verifying that the nodes in the settings.conf uh, the settings in the settings.conf match what type of will you want to execute onto the network settings such as what type of blocks will you accept what's your maximum block size what you know which other nodes will you communicate with um, if you're a miner you know which nodes which transactions you'll allow to transact you know if you're not doing any of those things in reality as a person running a quote full node you're just a slave to the default and you're just a slave to whoever whoever handed you those defaults and so you must stay forever vigilant. Uh, you must you must either compile your own code and audit it yourself, or trust whoever did it for you, because double clicking an exe it's not enough, All right? Sure. So my yeah. my response <laughs> on that, and I think there's some truth to what you're saying, certainly. Uh, but my response would be: we have a spectrum of technicality let's say a technical mm -hmm. proficiency right so you've got people all on the other end of the spectrum who are straight Bitcoin's up they better. can read every line it's, of code. it's better you know what i mean bitcoin's better we know we know right. how many coins they're printing it's very likely you got a good source it's easier to download a good source than a bad source it is an improvement right but I, so i i, I want to speak very specifically because a lot of people say things that are fraudulent and inaccurate and disgusting about what i believe is a very good technology and because people think that that will pump the price, they let them get away with it. And I find it disgusting. So for instance, there's a celebrity in the space that will go on television and say, if you don't believe in Bitcoin, you don't believe in cryptography. And I find that disgusting because cryptography preceded Bitcoin and Bitcoin stands on the back of cryptography and the back of open source uh, databases, which it stores all of its data in. So Bitcoin is a database that stores all of its data in another database. And it was originally the Berkeley DB, and now it's the level DB system. And without that system, there would be no Bitcoin, right? And, we, and we've borrowed the, the QT GUI EXE, um, which is also an open source project. There's, and we used OpenSSL to verify transactions for a long time until you know, we had our own libsec 256p library. So like, you know, I, I don't like the euphemisms and I don't like the platitudes, and I and I like to speak very specifically about what blockchains are good at and what they're not good at, and that makes a lot of people angry in the maximalist and, and often Austrian communities, because they want to live with blinders on, and it's weird because this this is a group of people that prides themselves on seeing past the, you know the the uh, the curtain, right? So who who's the Wizard of Oz and who's really behind the curtain? And they think they found that guy, but in reality they're just like creating another curtain, which is, you know, there's only one way to do trustless communication and it's Bitcoin. And there's only one way to transfer value and it's Bitcoin. And there's only one way to get rich in crypto and it's Bitcoin. And everything else is a nightmare and horrible and disgusting. And it's a hundred percent factually incorrect. Like, it, like, so a couple it, things there. Um, I would say I'm, so this comes back to what kind of maximalist are you, right? So yeah. there's the view of what I call monetary maximalism, and that's my friend uh, Pierre Richard who coined that term, but essentially it's around that idea of believing that it's saleability and liquidity that will inevitably drive people towards one best money, right? So that's the monetary maximalist view. Now, you might also contrast that with something like a platform maximalist view, this idea that, oh, everything technologically must be built on Bitcoin. Right. So my view would be more like monetary maximalism, not necessarily platform maximalism. Right. So okay. in that case, I would say not I say I wouldn't say, oh, every messaging thing has to be built on Bitcoin. Well, no, I would say Bitcoin is the money and other things will get built up on top of that. So that's that's my view. <laughs> hey, it, it's an OK view. I used to have that view, too. Right. Um, and then I then I decided I wanted more. So let's so let's keep let's keep finding agreement. And while we're finding agreement, you know, getting that nuance because I think there's a lot of content there, right? Like if you and I agreed on everything, 
well, no one's learning everything. It's basically like a monologue with two people. So it's good that we, we find agreement and, and we find nuance, which is slight difference, right? So we both yep. like peer-to-peer value transfer. We both like knowing what the actual supply of the currency is. We both like, uh, you know, knowing what the future total supply will be. We probably both like the inflation rate reducing over time, right? You like the inflation maybe, rate going down over I time? Would think, uh, Helps the price I go up? I think of that more like, no, no, I certainly don't want it to go up, right? I would just think of that more like, it was, it was more like a number got chosen and because that's now the number, everyone just agrees on that, right? Like that showing point idea. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter that much about like what was the specific rate and how is it decreasing and so on. It was more just like this number came out, mm-hmm. everyone agreed on it, and that's yep. what we can agree on. It, it wasn't to, like, even declared in the white paper. It wasn't even in Sorry. the white paper. The having yeah, every right. four I'll, years yeah, was not even in the white paper. Nor was the one yeah, that no, that's, block that's, on that's, Yeah. Yeah, so I don't, um, I don't, you know, I don't doubt that. Uh, I think, yeah. it's, uh, as uh, Nick Zabo would talk, he would talk about your political argument surface, right? In the same way you might think of it like a Texas, you can have a political. You're gonna have to restate. You're gonna have to. About. You're gonna have to restate the uh, the legal attack surface again, because you chopped a bit the connection. So he was speaking about this idea of how similar to how we think of from a computer security point of view about attack surface and you want to minimize that attack surface right just generally mm-hmm. speaking from a security point of view yeah but then uh nick zabo was basically making an analogy and he was saying actually you can think of this like political argument surface we're minimizing sure. the number of things that people could just kick up a stink about and that's why this 21 million and okay the actual correct number is actually just a little bit less than that because of this that and the other but sure broadly yeah. 21 million yep i mean i can I can tell you some coins that were, were permanently lost due to like a hard fork rollback back when 6 billion Bitcoin got printed. The transaction that printed those yep. lost its reward of 50 BTC. So the actual supply is at least 50 BTC lower forever because of that. Um, yep. And there's the one example where a miner only took less than the full amount that they were entitled to take. And there was another example where I think a miner screwed up the calculation. Yeah, I mean, there's little examples like this. So the actual number they're, is they're like, less than rounding whatever, it's, it's million, almost nine, nine thousand, whatever. Eight, yeah. You know, just done. But, I mean, essentially, the point is, it's twenty-one million, and that's what most people have agreed on. That's what people have opted into. That's what matters in the end. Right. Well. Yeah. So we're going so here's so saying. here's so here's the thing. Because blockchains are socially enforced networks. So let me give you an example of what I mean by being socially enforced. Bitcoin Cash has a longer blockchain than Bitcoin does. Why? Because they used an emergency difficulty retarget, which allowed the miners to game it, which allowed them to get more block rewards by showing that you know it needed to be down targeted down and then mining a lot when the retarget down occurred. And so there's extra inflation in that system and a higher block height, even though they both forked from the same block. Now in Bitcoin, it is stated that the authoritative, accurate, valid chain is the longest chain. Well, uh uh-oh, there's a new longest chain. And so then people had to go, oh, I guess we had it wrong. What we want is not actually the longest chain, but we want is the heaviest chain. And that means length times uh you know energy that went in to create it hash rate times length and then it lands you back on the main chain again right now who do you socially believe in order to enforce that you have to believe a developer that tells you actually this is the rule we're using now and you have to look outside of the software and outside of the system to measure other weights of other chains to see if in fact those are the authoritative chains right and the same so my view is it's more like it's as has been explained by other people like Nassim Taylor this idea of shelling point right if you had to meet somebody in New York you didn't know the time and the place and in the, in the book he talks about um, he says 12 noon at central right and so the yep. point is where do people go and I totally accept your point that yeah there is a bit of a social layer of consensus well, sh- shelling that, points are only easy the- when they're not a shelling point is only easy to arrive at when there's not a wide range of conscious 
reasonable choices. So if, if instead of Central Station being the most popular station, the division of popular stations were threefold, and there was you know Central Stations A, B, and C, and they were in different locations, then you wouldn't be able, you would arrive at like a one third each person would decide that shelling point, right? So that shelling points are only effective when the tie breakers are rather obviously broken. But in, in a Bitcoin's case, when you go to Bitcoin.com and they're telling you the real Bitcoin is something else and they're telling you that that's the real intention of the white paper and they own the .com domain name for noob that doesn't know any better. I mean, that would sound pretty compelling, right? And then who are you going right. to go to and for so, your shelling point? You, right. you, it's, so, it, it's social consensus again. And, it's, and I'll just finish this point. Yeah, you finish. Well, you know what? You 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 finish that point because this this thing is like an almost different point. So go ahead. Sure. So uh, the way I would counter, uh, I would think about that is think of it more from an economic point of view. Mm -hmm. There are strong opportunity costs holding one money over another money, right? It's can, easy can I ask to you? Are, are you I know this. Is, can, but... I know this is a stupid question, but your internet connection kind of sucks. Um, is there any way to make your internet connection better? Uh, I'm running you, VPN. I could turn it off. You should turn that off because the connection is unbearable. You just keep dropping out. All right, all right. And your video know. is choppy. It's like super choppy. Like the video is a joke. Like you just paused, basically. One sec. One sec. All right. Okay. Wow. It looks a lot better now. How's it now? It's good? It's a miracle better. Thank God. Okay. Yes. No worries. I'm glad I asked. All right. So, um, it was quite bad. <clears throat> Go ahead. Yeah, so, so going back to that point, uh, so the opportunity cost, the very strong opportunity cost of holding one money over another. And part of but in that. In the case is of a fork, you got both for free. There's no opportunity cost at the fork instant. Uh, but you, yes, but you could then, uh, but you might then speculate then on, and now again, you could be quote unquote neutral and not redeem the fork and just not take a position and just let the market decide. I, I believe I believe neutral is a position. And, and as a trader, I, I wrote a guide for everyone to sell their BCH at 0.16. And now it's at like 0.3 or something. So en enjoy all that money, guys, that I hooked you up with for showing you how to dump your bags, right? Um, I, you know, I, like, right. I, I believe that that neutral is a position. I, I'm just saying, so I don't I don't want to go too deep into this. So so what my my important goal here is to show you that the stuff that you believe in is cool and I believe in it too. And I've found better ways to do all of it. So if you want people to be able to transmit value in a peer to peer way, then doing that with censorship resistance is better. And I will tell you that you have more censorship resistance in the Ethereum network than you have in the Bitcoin network. And I will, I will justify it with facts that you can go check, right? If you don't like paying a bunch of fees to a bunch of people that just pollute the environment with the energy, well, you can pay fees to people that pollute the environment less and give you better security on the Ethereum network than you could do it on the Bitcoin network. If you want to use a stable coin, which is the majority of crypto usage, the majority of crypto usage, the most, not the majority, but the most popular crypto for transactions is Tether. If you use Bitcoin, you don't have decentralized finance. You don't have a peer to peer stable coin, but in Ethereum you do, you have a peer to peer stable coin. And so instead of having a bank, that you insert an extra county party into in between you and the bank so that you can't even sue the bank. And if the bank screws them, they'll screw you, right? And you don't get any interest on the account. That's what a stable coin is. So if you're in the Bitcoin ecosystem, you were locked into something which is worse, which is a non peer to peer extra counterparty stable coin. Whereas in the Ethereum ecosystem, you're not right. If you, if you want privacy, You've got a ZK snark system already rolled out on Ethereum called Zether. However, it takes too much gas, so you can't use it right now. You've got optimistic rollups, which can do 100x the throughput on chain. If you want to talk about those, talk to Eric Wall. I'm, I'm out of the, the loop on a lot of the new cool ZK snark and ETH2 stuff. They've got a more aggressive roadmap. They've got lower transaction fees. You know, uh, there's two coins that tried to build on top of Bitcoin. Counterparty XCP that burnt 2000 Bitcoin to launch and Omni protocol and Tether used to run on the Omni protocol on top of Bitcoin and they left it and moved the majority of their trades over to ERC 20 and Ethereum because it works better. So the coin that actually does more volume 
than any other cryptocurrency, left Bitcoin goodbye, bye bye, and went to Ethereum because it's better, right? Like you like atomic cross swaps, all the ERC 20s can atomic cross swaps against all the other ones with no order book, no counterparty risk, trustless. What can you atomic cross swap with Bitcoin? Basically jack shit, right? So you're so forced to use yeah. a worse stable coin. You're forced to use shittier counterparties because there's no atomic cross swaps because you live in this little fucking bubble, this little bubble, you won't interact or communicate with anything else. And finance is more than currency, right? Finance is more than currency. The project I built addresses time deposits. Time deposits are worth 7.2 trillion in the United States and China. That's more than printed currency, which is what Bitcoin is designed to replace. So I'm addressing a larger market cap that serves more users with lower fees and better security. Infl Bitcoin's had two inflation bugs. Ethereum's had zero inflation bugs, right? Bitcoin rolled back the chain once, Ethereum rolled back the chain once. R Ethereum rolled back the chain to screw over a hacker. Bitcoin rolled back the chain just because the code failed. And the code is likely to continue to run into inflation bugs because it's spaghetti code with no modularity. In Hex, the consensus network code is locked into a smart contract that no one can edit, and therefore it's nearly impossible to accidentally screw up the consensus code. But it's very easy to do in Bitcoin because an improvement to the networking stack to reduce latency caused an inflation bug, which let anyone print as, money, as much money as they found. And since Bitcoin doesn't even have a bug bounty program, which Ethereum does, that bug was found by a Bitcoin Cash developer who disclosed it honorably. He could have used it. If you found that bug, would you just print some free Bitcoin or would you tell the world about it? Hmm. Right. Yeah, no. Okay. So look, there's a lot of there's a lot of different points I've got to we're going to hit there. So, <clears throat> okay. So, I could go all day. Like I, I I used to be a maximalist, and I'm not now, and I, I know how to play both sides of the coin, and I'm on the right side. <clears throat> okay. So look, let me uh, let me give a high level comment about this, right? So first of all, I would suggest we have to think of this firstly as a money, not as a technology. Right. It's most important to think of it as a money first. The other stuff like is. But they don't. That's what? kind of. I, I disagree so, with that because it's not used as a money anywhere. There's only 800 people that even accept it on the internet. 800, unless that website is terribly bad at finding them. Nothing is priced <laughs> in it. It's priced in USD. There's only 2.8 million wallets that have over a thousand dollars in them. I mean, it is sure as fuck not used as a money. It's used as a speculative instrument. They don't even use it on the dark. Well, I mean, they use it on the dark net, but that's is, only like five percent of total volume. I think. From the articles I've seen in the darknet markets, they are still using Bitcoin. Yes, as primarily, the primarily, currency. but that's 5% so of the market cap. There, and look, I think the broader point is this is not something that I think people come out and expect Bitcoin to kind of be born and just ready, ready to go straight away. For 10 years, 10 years. Do you know how long it took WhatsApp to take over the world? Two years. The you know how long it took Fortnite that's to take over the world? One year. 10 years in technology's game. eternity, truthfully. I think that's actually very short. Uh, we've not. been using, you know, government money for how many, how many years? Many decades. How many? Uh, okay, so let's list, let's list some companies like Airbnb or WhatsApp or like it, Fortnite or Clash of Clans. All of these companies have hundreds of millions of users in a shorter time frame than Bitcoin got to 3 million users. It's probably a bit more than three million, but it's not. Okay. Let's it's even, not. Even, it can show you million. on chain. Look, there's only two point eight million wallets that have over a thousand dollars in them, and most people have more than one address. Not wallets. Two point eight million addresses, and most people have more than one address. So there's probably only like one point five or two million actual entities that even hold more than a thousand dollars of Bitcoin. Furthermore, forty percent of Bitcoin is held in addresses that hold over a thousand coins. I don't think you're one of those guys. Which means that the vast majority of this thing you love so much is owned by an economic class of people of which you are not a member and are unlikely to ever be. And so it's funny when I see guys talk about disrupting the banks and changing the world and helping onboard the poor people when the banks own more coins than you, right? Tim Draper bought the Silk Road coins. He's got over 100K coins. The Winklevi have over 100K coins. Plus Token Ponzi has over 100K coins. The Mt. Gox trustee has over 140K coins. And how many do you have? And so you think you're participating in this world-changing, amazing ecosystem that's going to bring power to the little guy. But in reality, the little guys are just pumping the bags of the fucking banks. Oh, and by the way, my currency fixes that because we penalize those wheels 75%. Not it ultimately comes down to money is neutral. And so, yes, there will be some. No, it's not. Yes, there will... No, it's not. What are you talking about money is neutral? 
We, what? As in, I mean, in the sense that it's a neutral tool, right? In the same way that you, know, you can use a knife to cut uh, food, or you can like sort of go to. I mean, look, that's a cool story, yeah. but like, I, it's just not the case. I mean, let's let's talk about how neutral Bitcoin is, okay? Can your grandmother use it? Fuck no. All right, so it's ageist off the bat, right? And how many girls are in crypto? Fucking none, right? I know. I look at my demographics; it's one or two percent. So this concept that like. Money is like neutral, maybe, but Bitcoin ain't fucking neutral. I can tell you that for sure. <laughs> like it is, it is not neutral at all. I think it's, it's again, it's a long term process. I think we do this more like a multi decade process. And did you turn your VPN back on? Because you're chopping. an email server back in the early days, right? It's like it takes time, and especially with Bitcoin, people have to learn a bit more about how to run your own node and how to do these aspects around key management and so on that these are becoming easier over time so i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, repeat what you said so that the people can understand it because it's chopping so bad i believe what St i believe what stefan said was that he believes this is a multi-decade process and people need to learn how to do the hard things like download and run their own node right and these hey, are getting can, easier people are time. saying to turn your video off and just go uh go audio only that's a good idea can you, can you try that? Okay, sure. All right. Uh, yeah. Okay. What's that? I think it's better. It's up to you. But look, I would say that there's a lot there around the monetary component, but it's going to take time. This is not the sort of thing that can just happen overnight. And I, the way you're painting it is sort of like, oh, it should have been formed, and like, oh, grandma should be able to use Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, let me, in or whatever, um, let, me, yeah. let me respond to this. First of all, lots of other coins that are not Bitcoin are having no problem onboarding millions and millions of users. Unfortunately, those coins are Ponzi schemes and scams. One coin onboarded millions of users. BitConnect onboarded millions of users. The Plus Token Ponzi made the 3K bottom and made the 14K top when their founders were arrested. So even our price chart in Bitcoin is the slave to the Ponzi schemes who actually have the margin and the marketing to advertise into the real world and onboard people, something that Bitcoin does not have and is not going to have ever. Because with the awesome censorship resistance, unfortunately, came economic uh, spread, economic censorship resistance. There's no one has a big enough bag that can make enough profit onboarding a new user to pay the $200 it might cost to bring them on. Or maybe you could do it for really cheap, you could do it for 20, right? You pay 25 cents a click, it costs you, let's say 100 clicks to get somebody. Okay, well now that just costs you, you know, $25, right? And now can you get them to buy Bitcoin? And how much Bitcoin do they have to, make, have to buy in order to drive the price up far enough for you to make your $25 back? It's too far spread out, which is the reason you can make a Bitcoin.com that sells a big Bitcoin and never get sued. But if you try that with XRP, you'll get this crap suit out of you because they have enough economic centralization to defend their corporate interests, right? And they have marketing budgets and they can do partnerships with other people and put out advertisements, things that Bitcoin can't do. And these are all things that I'm solving with my project, which I'm giving for free to Bitcoin holders. I'm penalizing whales 75%. I'm making it so that Mt. Gox can't claim. I'm putting a referral program in there that pays 20% so that anyone else that has an audience in the space can onboard users into something better for free and they can all get paid and have margin, right? And I've got audits, which Bitcoin doesn't have any audits. I've got two, two contract audits and one economics audit. Bitcoin has none of these things, no audits, no bug bounty program, right? Like, you still there? Yeah, so okay. my, no, I wanted to just let you finish off. Um, sure. But my view is that, again, it's, it's, People don't want to, I call this the die on a hill factor, right? Nobody is going to go die on a hill to make Brad Garlinghouse and the Ripple guys rich, right? They did. Bitcoin is different. He was the richest guy in the world in 2017. What are you talking about? Well, at one point, yeah. But I'm saying yeah. people well, how much, Was go that like, not enough? Like, is that, what, should he have aimed higher? Inter, intergalactic richest guy? Like, come on. stay rich? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's still richer than both of us, yeah. And I'm pretty okay, sure well, that what he built transfers more volume than anything that either of us has built yet, right? So here, here's the thing about shit talking other coins. Do you know anyone that lost money transacting on Dogecoin due to a 51% attack? 
No, you don't. No, they're just a fork of Bitcoin. At, right, but I think with the with that, it's some of these. Uh, it's like swimming. It's like that saying, you know, you only know who's swimming who's swimming naked when the tide goes out, right? Like some of these coins. Yeah, but this is coming uh, from a guy whose favorite currency just dropped eighty five percent again, again, again. Your coin dropped eighty five percent, and Dogecoin dropped ninety five percent. So don't appeal to some blue chip extra badass status. You don't have one. You had to roll back your chain. You've had two inflation bugs. You're not getting a security. You're not. You don't even have bug bounty program. You're not going to get an anonymity upgrade. It's not going to happen. You had to lie, cheat, and steal to get SegWit 2x by promising two megabyte blocks to get SegWit and then screwing them over and not giving them the two megabyte blocks. Do you think they'll fall for that again? Do you think I that think Coinbase is going to allow an anonymity here. fork in? I think you're anthropomizing a lot here, though, because it's not that you know Bitcoin uh, went been... and uh, said, "Oh yeah, we'll do two uh, x and SegWit." There were a lot of people who were just like, "No, I want SegWit only. I never agreed to two x." That was never part of the deal. And so, again, Bro, this is one of those things where, where I guess looking so do back... You think, do you think you're going to get... Okay, so what, what privacy technology do you think you're going to get in Bitcoin and when do you think you're going to get it? So on this point, I think Lightning Network will actually provide a fair amount of privacy. It won't be perfect, but I think it'll be, <laughs> quote unquote, good enough, right? right. So I think likely, so you... <laughs> if I had to speculate what I believe will come, I think it'll be... At least with the knowledge I have today, I believe we will see Lightning Network used for small transactions and perhaps coin joined post mix Bitcoin transactions uh, for larger transactions that are above that sort right. of amount. So, that's so the answer, the answer that you've Lightning. given is we are not going to get anonymity in Bitcoin is the answer you just gave. You gave a whole lot of words for other networks that aren't Bitcoin, right? Like the Lightning Network, it is not Bitcoin. It is not in the same repo. It does not have the same developers. It does not use the same port. It does not use the same code. There's no fucking relation, which is why the Lightning Network has had critical vulnerabilities recently that have lost people money in the last two months, but Bitcoin hasn't, okay? And if Lightning does work, do you know what other coins it'll work for? All of them, because it's just a bunch of exchanging of time-locked signatures, and that shit works for everybody. So when it works for Bitcoin, it'll also work with Raiden on uh, Ethereum and with state channels and with all these other technologies that are out there. So it's not even a competitive advantage, right? And how late is that project? And when will it actually come out? The, the point is, we shouldn't even be talking about whether Lightning is good or not, because it doesn't have fuck all to do with Bitcoin. It really doesn't, right? Like, like no one's getting, like, it, it is an unrelated technology that has absolutely nothing in common whatsoever, other than fans of Bitcoin tend to be fans of it. And that is all. But the Lightning Network right now is actually much bigger on Bitcoin than it is on any other coin right now. That that's yeah, true but, to say. But it's all also, but, but it's actually not. Like there's four million dollars of Bitcoin wrapped on the Ethereum network with BitGo as a counterparty with WBTC. And there's six million dollars in the Lightning Network. Both of those numbers are pitifully fucking small. But the fact that Ethereum it even Ethereum even had a larger amount than the Lightning Network at one point. And I, I would almost guarantee that as time passes, there will be more Bitcoin on Ethereum than there is on actual Bitcoin because there's so much DeFi going in there because it allows anyone to build trustless financial instruments that Bitcoin can't. Oh, remember when I told you about Counterparty and Omni? Totally failed, totally. Go look at their price chart. Pure death for five years. Why? Because building on Bitcoin sucks balls, which is now no one fucking does it because they tried and they failed 100%. Their products worked fine. You wanted to wrap transactions maybe and run them on Bitcoin, you could have. And maybe so maybe they were ahead of their time and also maybe the usages got priced down by other things rather than those tokens specifically the so omni the me. majority of trading volume in crypto is tether and they switched from omni on bitcoin to erc20 on ethereum you can't get any more clear than that that's that's not theory that's real world people voting with the real world money and that's over 50 percent. it's over 33 percent of transactions on ethereum are those tether transactions so like Look, I think a lot of this stuff is ultimately, I would say that's kind of, you're kind of pointing to all these sort of peripheral things when- How is, how is, saying, how is Tether doing more transaction volume than Bitcoin peripheral? It's getting its shit kicked in. Bitcoin is getting curb stomped. It's getting fucked up. It's getting annihilated. It dropped 85% and is not doing as much transaction volume as other coins. And his fucking bugs appearing. Like, at what point do you realize that you can do better? It's getting fucked up, mate. The only person that goes publicly and defends it is me. I'm the one that goes on television to defend Bitcoin. 
because I do a good fucking job of it and I don't bullshit about it, right? I'm one of the top three or four speakers in the world to promote Bitcoin and say nice things about it. How fucking pitiful is that? Right? Like, Bro, like, what? Where's the actual good I'm shit not going? Sure on? I would agree with that. I mean, okay. So name the top like four. Many... Name the top four. Name the top four. Andreas. Top four. Well, Trace Meyer. Andreas. He would be yep. up there. Yep. Andreas. Okay. Trace Meyer. Someone like Trace would yep. be up there. Uh, who else? Someone like Safetyn. He'd be up there. Dude, he alienates uh, hard as fuck anyone in the world that hears him. He's not a good representative for the brand. People hate him more than they like him. Andreas is a better representative for the brand because he doesn't create enemies as a hobby. He doesn't go out of his well, way to make enemies. Look, ultimately, I think it's... But but notice that we're running out of people, it. right? So, like, that was three. Okay, so I would put me in the top four there. Who who would who would mm, displace me? Okay, who would displace me? Well, as in who... Uh, what, when you're yeah, saying who, who better sells Bitcoin four, to the public? Are you saying who's, as in who's a better salesman of it or who has who does been a better job in representing, the media? Who does a better job representing Bitcoin in the public eye? I've been on television representing it multiple times. So... Like who, yeah, who's I think um, Melton Pomp? Pomp? did a good job recently. Yeah, she's done good. Okay. Uh, yep. I'd say she's done very well. Yep. Yep. Um, so I would be top else? five at that. Uh, Elise, Elise Colleen, if you've seen her, Never she her. she did a fantastic job. I haven't heard of her. Um, who else? Um, I think the Coindisk guys do pretty well, but you don't see them very much. Yeah, so I don't know too much about them yeah. in particular. So, um, but look, I, I just, I'm, I I'm up there in the I, top I single script. digits, man. You run out of speakers. Uh, look, I don't know. I, 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 don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't be as sure. I, but I think, let me just talk to a couple of points that I, I think. Yeah, I, I want you to, because I'm going to rape all points. your points. I'm going to rape them all. That is going to be awesome. I cannot wait to violate your points. Please go ahead. <laughs> sure, sure. Look, ultimately, I, I, one, I think one way to think of it is like Taj Dreiser, right? He was one of the writer, the authors of the Lightning Network, and he explains it like Bitcoin is the money of enemies, right? So ultimately, it doesn't matter about whether Safety is a nice and fluffy, likable guy. It yeah, matters what true. money is. That's there. not true. That's not true because you require consensus to upgrade the fucking network. And the same consensus that you use to upgrade the network is the same exact consensus you can use to downgrade the network. So just like they double click the new EXE that, that cuts their uh, coin issuance in half in about seven months or eight months, right? They, they allow that to happen. They could also just double their issuance instead, right? So like these are socially enforced networks and having enemies and such just locks the code so that you can't improve anything anymore. Some would say that's a good thing. And the other thing is also you have to consider the incentive of people who already hold the coin. And also, if you wanted to change Bitcoin, you would need an overwhelming majority. So you wouldn't be able to just like instantly double the supply like that, right? That's... Because most of the already existing holders would not go with that. They would not run that software and then therefore Bitcoin would not change. Right. So let's so let's talk about that. OK, if you think that users are as powerful as miners and exchanges, you are 100 percent wrong. There is a power hierarchy. OK. And when the UASP, no 2X movement, which I was a member of and promoted, put the gun to the head of Bitcoin and said, we're not going to allow two megabyte blocks, so don't even try it, right? We're not going to signal for them. So everyone started their little nodes that didn't mind crap and then just selected to signal that they wouldn't promote um, SegWit 2X, right? What that really meant was if you miners try and push SegWit 2X and push two megabyte blocks on us, we will Sybil attack the network and make it appear as though real Bitcoin is this other network. Now, let me tell you what would happen if that really occurred. The fork that didn't want the two megabyte blocks, that didn't mine their own blocks, would be 51% and reorged at will by the miners that have nearly infinite more hash rate than them, which means that the miners would have a properly functioning network that worked by the rules that they chose and wasn't able to roll back. And then you'd have the fake, angry, no 2X UASP guys that wear cool looking hats, right? And I, and I was on that team, okay? I supported that, right? They would have a network that was fucking useless and absolutely nothing could be done on it and could be attacked at will by anyone that chose to do so, period, right? So this concept that all users get to have an equal say in the network is 100% false, 100%. I wouldn't say all users have an equal say. I would say large holders have an... Uh, uh, proportionate say, right? So if you're a larger hold, holder and if you're receiving more Bitcoin, then it's in your ability to, it's in your rejection. Holding and receiving are different Bitcoin. statements. Those are opposites. 
So you have to choose which one you mean. Are you talking about people that have income? Are you talking about businesses in the space? Are you talking about people that bought a bag a long time ago and have a, a large amount of energy stored in, in steak days or uh, days destroyed, right? So like the amount of days that you haven't used your coin. It sucks that when we talk about days destroyed, what we really mean is days not destroyed. So I'm just going to do that now. I'm going to fix that language now. Coin days not destroyed, right? So people that have built up that economic energy, I don't think they have any say at all. I think if Satoshi's dead and he's got a million coins, which he does, and he's never moved them, he doesn't have any fucking say whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I think the economic system would work better if his coins were removed and people could have better economic certainty about their future so that we know his kids aren't fucking evil and just dump on us and nuke the price to zero because they want to buy a, a boat, a, a 400 yard long boat, right? How is that better for so the my world? suggestion on that would be that would begin opening up that whole political attack vector because then someone would say, hey, they took his coins. Why couldn't they take someone yeah, we, else's coins? We coins? already have now, that. What have you done? We You've already have that. that whole fear again of not having certainty over the coins that you we hold. We already have that because the State Department ruled that you had to ban the China fentanyl gang guy and the Iranian uh, malware guy's addresses. So I think you'll find that if you happen to be the unlucky private key holder to those addresses, you're going to have a very hard time getting anyone to interact with them because people tend to not want to violate the State Department's rulings. Right. But even in those examples, I think the government, and this is probably, again, a, a case of the government being naive or not understanding it well, but they basically banned, they blasted certain addresses where someone could just move them, right? They could sure. just move them out of those addresses or just uh, yep. run them to the coin join or take it into another address. And it's Maybe Not they really did the best they could. Anything, right? Yes, I, I agree. Maybe they did the best they could. You know, they they put up laws about speeding and everyone still speeds. But it puts a chilling effect on speeding so that some people don't. And it puts a chilling effect on, on people that want to do dirty crap with the coins. And so some people won't. So, yes, I agree. It is, it is not the most effective thing they can do. So, so here's the funny part, right? I want most of the things that you want. And I found a better way to get them. But then I spend my time shit talking something that I, I like. I like Bitcoin, right? Like the biggest bag I own is a bag of Bitcoin, okay? I want the price to go sky fucking high. But I'm not willing to say incorrect things about it. And I'm not willing to not make progress because some type of tribal blinders or silliness or anything, right? I'm telling you there's networks which transact value in a safer way with lower fees and better features that are onboarding more users you should be excited about that. But you find it hard to be excited about that because you swallowed the tribalism pill. And now being a Bitcoiner is part of your identity. And if I go on your YouTube channel, it says Austrian economics guy, right? I can tell you there's a lot of advantages to Keynesian economics, but it's gonna be hard to explain those to you because you've labeled yourself already as an Austrian guy. And so you've got to carry the flag, right? So if you, if you get an XRP tattoo and I try and tell you, hey, you know, XRP is not really doing anything with banks, probably going to be hard for me to win that 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 conversation right i mean look at this right, I've, I've, given you you, 20, I've given you 10 or 20 i've given you 10 or 20 points i've given you 10 or 20 right, so really cogent really... points that you're just not able to combat but they're not having any effect on your psychology they just roll off you so i tell you you can get everything that you want better faster cheaper more secure and you're like yeah i'm gonna pretend you didn't say that shit, and i'm just gonna keep loving what i love right that's cognitive dissonance on your no, part because i think ultimately i think you're it's like a <clears throat> Are saying, oh, look, this thing's cheaper, this thing's more secure, but maybe I disagree that, that, that it is cheaper. So, that it is so more that's secure. important. Yes, that that's really important. Why don't we go into that? Because if we, disagree, if we disagree on the facts, like if we disagree, if we agree on the facts and then we disagree on the outcomes, then we can talk about logical process. But if we disagree on the facts themselves, you really shouldn't go any farther because you're just wasting your time, right? Like you can't build a good house foundation on sand. You need bedrock, right? So let's go to those things. Let's go to one by one those things, okay? Do you think Bitcoin transactions are more secure than Ethereum's? And if so, why? Yes, so uh, I think the best example is if you go to that site, howmanyconfs.com. Mm -hmm. It's a good site. It shows essentially the equivalent amount of, um, let, me, let me pull that up now. I already, I already so, know what you're talking about and I can explain it to the audience. Certain networks have more right, hash rate sure. than other networks and therefore, in order to have a reasonable amount of security that your transaction won't be rolled back, the shittier and lower the hash rate, the longer and longer you have to wait to feel certain that your money's not gonna be taken away from you. So more confirmations. So when you go on exchange, the shittier, lower hash rate the coin, the more and more confirmations you have to wait, 
right? Yep, yep. Okay, cool. So what that in effect really means is that we're measuring hash rate, right? That's all we're doing. We're measuring uh, hash bit rate. A bit of a tough question, though, because even there, there are different proof of work algorithms, right? So obviously, SHA two fifty six versus I'm, I'm the telling you that web, I'm telling you that website can only perform calculations on hash rate because there's nothing else they could measure. They've got price, right? No, and no, they've no, got no, hash I rate. I don't deny and that. That's it. Okay. So now, so now your position that I've I've you know algebraically turned into like a single unit, right? I've like removed all the extra parts and made its core basis is hash rate matters. That's your position, okay? If I increase the Bitcoin hash rate by tenfold with my mining hardware, I've increased the uh, Bitcoin security by tenfold? Oh, that's not a, okay. Ah, I think it's one of the- It turns out that if I increase the hash rate by tenfold, I fuck the network and it's really just my network now. And so it turns out that hash rate doesn't actually mean jack shit unless you're getting attacked, right? So what you really care about, if you care about censorship resistance, is the honesty of the parties that have the hash rate, their ability to resist corruption, and their unlikeliness to collude with each other is what you really care about and was really the only thing that matters. And so people that find that hard to measure, which is everyone, because it is hard to measure, fall back on something that doesn't actually matter which is the raw hash rate, unless you're a minority coin, right? If you're a hegemony coin that already controls the vast majority of the hash rate, you could double or cut your hash rate in half and it really doesn't make a fucking difference. Bcash had an equivalent amount of hash rate to Bitcoin and it didn't really matter to either party, right? Because again, it comes back to which one do people think is really the money? Which one, which one do people think we already is know actually that. more likely? We already know that because we have market cap tables, we have charts, we have order volume, we have transaction volume. If I were an alien and I came to this planet and I said, hey, what's the most popular cryptocurrency? The answer would be Tether because it trades the most volume, period. It doesn't meet your worldview. To tell you the truth, it doesn't meet my worldview either. I fucking hate it. But it, that's the but, reality. Uh, I, okay, so the difference, I think, again, so you're conflating here a bit here because you're saying, oh, yeah, Tether's the cryptocurrency. Everyone can just use Tether, blah, blah, blah. Why? No, why I, I dislike Tether not... greatly. I, I, I greatly, greatly dislike it. Greatly. Like, it is a huge counterpart. It is the opposite of what crypto was invented for. Crypto was invented to remove counterparties. So what do they do? Most popular crypto adds a counterparty. Okay, well that's not what I want. That's not what I want for my crypto. But again, that's but it's what not, the market wants. Okay, so let me let me let me touch on this point. So I would say the way to think of that is Bitcoin has. Okay, I would say don't confuse payments with money. Bitcoin is trying to be money. So it's like, think okay, of it like... You guys have a minority uh, of the market cap as well. I don't know why you bring up points well, that are bad for you. Like, you, thank you for bringing yeah. up that your market cap also sucks. Well, <laughs> not quite. I think it's more like, it's, it's, it's a, it, needs, it needs a combo of these things. And that's why you can't just kind of nail down on exactly one thing. Like, okay, it's not just hash rate. Which one has the most hash rate? It's not just that. Because it's ultimately about which one has the known you know, monetary policy in, in advance and at the same time has resistance you know like like we were saying the censorship resistance part whereas something like if you're just if you're just using tether you're not going to save in tether or not realistically because it's, they not, do. it's not the same thing you might they as well do. just save in us dollars at that point whereas well, they really with Bitcoin, do there is, a, there is a real difference and yes it is speculative demand i fully so i i would yeah i would agree with that but the, the point around the speculative demand i think of it more like this is speculation on further adoption and so, we can anticipate based on, you know, the characteristics of Bitcoin that we may see further adoption. So that's, that's, that's how I would so, characterize so, that. So, so here's, here's where we're at. I tell you other coins are onboarding new users. I tell you other coins are doing more transactions. I tell you other coins are safer. I tell you other coins have more utility and can plug into DeFi and have peer-to-peer -peer stable coins, but you guys don't. I show you that people trying to build on your ecosystem have failed. I show that you have already had to roll back your own chain. I show that you are likely to have more problems in the future due to spaghetti code and due to having no bug bounty program. But for some reason, magically, even though I've curb stomped every single feature that you've possibly had, now I'll just mention the fact that you haven't had a, uh, a feature increase in the last two years. The last uh, good thing that you got was SegWit, and all it was was a 25% throughput increase with some transaction malleability fixes, which truthfully shouldn't have been there in the first place, right? So I've, I've shown you Every single thing that you love about your coin is getting beat by Ethereum, pretty much. 
and the thing's running on Ethereum. Not quite, not quite. So, okay, well, on, I'm listening. No, no, no. I, I wouldn't I'm agree listening. with that. So, so, yeah, well, if you let me finish, hold on. So, uh, first off, with with the one way to think of it is buy support. Hold, hold on, right? hold on. Like Can I just mention, I don't own any right? Ethereum. I own like $100 of Ethereum. I, I own a shitload of Bitcoin. Right. I have like $100 of Ethereum. That's just great. so that you know, I'm let not me, like finish now. copying my bags. Right, let me Go. finish now. Yep. All right. Let me finish now because you keep jumping in. Yeah, so you can take an finish. hour to do it. Like I'm not ever, I'm not, I'm truly not trying to cut you off. Take as much time as you like. All right, great. So with one thing to think about this is, again, bringing you back to which one is more likely to be the money, which one has the liquidity, which one has the saleability. It is around, if you look on coinmarketbook.com, for example, it's got this thing called buy support. And that's saying sum of buy orders at 10% distance from highest bid price, right? And so you can see that it, that they site rate doesn't it work based anymore, on bro. buy support. Like, I tried to send Sorry? people to that site, but it doesn't exist anymore. Like it hasn't existed for like a few months now. Let me let me make sure I typed it right. I'm on there right now. Coinmarketbook.cc. Okay. Dot .cc, bro. Fuck, come on. Like I knew to type dot .cc at the end of the fucking URL. <laughs> like you got to include that. <laughs> Nobody knows to type dot .cc. Okay, I'll go to the site. I said I said coinmarket.cc. Anyway, oh, so, I didn't hear it. Look, the other point I would suggest is it's not really right to say, oh yeah, it more users either. and other people can more easily build on top of their coins, and oh look at all the people who failed to build on top of Bitcoin. But look at uh, fundamentally, more people are buying Bitcoin, and Bitcoin actually has more liquidity than any other crypto. Right? I agree with that. Uh, even on even further on that, if you look at the measure uh, on that side. Now the other point around transactions, I would suggest again. Bitcoin right now is more about hodling, right? So if you think of it more from a Trace Mayer point of view, seven network effects, the most important network effect of all is the speculation, the hodler network effect. Bitcoin dominates that. And Bitcoin has the best network effects out of all the cryptocurrencies because it's just got the strongest ones out of all. It's been around the longest. It has the most hard, hard the strong hands, not weak hands. And onto that, it's got a very vibrant developer community and another point I would, I would, I think as a slight mischaracterization from your side, in my view, you, you were saying, oh yeah, other currencies have more transactions on them. I'm not sure I agree with that because especially in a lightning world, when payments are onion routed, we don't actually know for sure how many transactions are occurring. We don't actually know what is the true size of the lightning network due to the private channels nature of it as well. You so do, I, I definitely every channel wouldn't has agree on some of not points. true. The last thing's not true. You know exactly how much money is in Lightning because you have to open the channel on the main net. So you count how much money is on the main net in the Lightning network. Furthermore, if you believe that the velocity of money reduces the value of money, which I do, then in a fully adopted network, more velocity lowers the value. Now, I don't believe that that applies to a not fully adopted network. And since Bitcoin is obviously not fully adopted, maybe we don't care about velocity right now. I, I, I support more velocity at this point. Um, vibrant developer community, are you kidding? You can't even commit code to the Bitcoin core code base without nine months of intense training if you're elite as fuck. And I'm quoting you numbers from uh, one of the developers at, uh, at Blockstream, whose name I can't remember right now. Uh, and then who else is building on the ecosystem? What Mimblewimble that just was shown to have like basically no anonymity today, right? Because of uh, the transaction graph being visible and that it's likely to not be patchable, right? That's news that came out today. And it doesn't matter because you probably, maybe if Mimblewimble could be a soft fork, maybe you could get into Bitcoin. I don't think you can get it as a soft fork. I think it requires a hard fork and then I don't think you're gonna get it because Coinbase, which doesn't sell anonymity coins and other large exchanges, which don't sell anonymity coins are not going to support a Bitcoin fork that rolls anonymity in because they might lose their bank accounts and then they have to go out of business or lose 80% of their income, right? So I love Bitcoin. I have a giant bag of it. I want the price to go up, but it is getting fucked up by a lot of other things. And the future is bright for a lot of other things. So I don't, I don't agree that the developer ecosystem is vibrant whatsoever. I don't believe the meme ecosystem is vibrant whatsoever. I don't believe that the number of people joining Bitcoin channels is vibrant whatsoever because I've joined them and they're dead. There's literally zero posts a day. You go on Telegram and you type Bitcoin and you go to the most popular Bitcoin channel Maybe once a day, an admin of that channel that has like six or seven or 10,000 people in it will say something <laughs> to another admin. And that's it. Maybe you're in the wrong channels. I'm not, bro, because I use the search function in Telegram and I type Bitcoin. So it's not, this is not a me problem, right? And I've tried other, I figured that can't be possible, right? I thought it was impossible. So I tried to find other ways to find popular channels, like looking through Combat's list of the top 200 channels and Googling it. Like I literally Googled like cryptocurrency Telegram channels. It's fucking dead, mate. Super dead. 
Even if you go on this with the I subreddit. That's, that's looking at the wrong channels. My view is that's looking at well, like send me the, links. the kind of... I yeah, mean, sure, if you, I'll send you a couple of links yeah. right now if you like. I'll, let me fire up my Telegram if you yeah. like. If Let's you can, you can jump in, for I example, like. there's, there's, you know, there's a few uh, product community Telegram chats that are running right now. So, for example, the cold card, which is a great um, uh, telegra uh, Telegram chat group. There's like 600 so what... people in there. Um, <laughs> there's various Bitcoin meetup groups as well. So, and, and I think the other thing to so think about So what's the most popular well Bitcoin is, group you know? Well, I think it's more like Bitcoin Twitter is where it really happens. Okay, so and just Bitcoin so that you know, you just 100% set me up for a punchline and then we're like, yo, just joke, just kidding. I, I wasn't serious about that. You told me that there were some good links on Telegram and then you named one for a hardware wallet that had 600 members in it. My price calls channel has 8,500 people in it. My trading channel has 3,500 people in it. My Bitcoin channel that I run has 5,500 people in it. And my new cryptocurrency, which I give free to Bitcoin holders, hex.win, has got 4,500 people in it. So I don't know where the fuck 600 comes on that list, right? Because I run like six That's channels. That's a hardware wallet. Remember, I have, I have six product. channels. with Right, so I'm on Telegram right now, and I'm typing Bitcoin in the search function, right? And then the first result I see that like looks popular is actually Bitcoin SV. Maybe, maybe there's something wrong with that. 362 members. Is well, the search function you, just suck? You're judging it on the wrong thing, though. Like, who well, cares just give me a high like, member count okay. Bitcoin channel that I'll go to, like right now. I, I'm on Telegram. I've got 10,000 plus I, users on there. I want to go to a popular Bitcoin channel. I Telegram. don't think, I don't, um, that's not where it really is down there. Okay. Maybe you're just like, like judging a, you know, a fish bite to, to, to climb a tree. Right? I think that's what you're doing here. <laughs> Essentially, the real. So every other like, crypto has a popular. Every I'm other right, every other po oh, every other crypto eight. has a popular Telegram channel, but Bitcoin doesn't because it's got the best network effect. <laughs> what, because bro? Like I show you reality, but you want to ignore it. Like it's not happening. Like I'm I'm curb stomping your arguments, but you're just not paying attention. And I'm giving you no, time to quiet, fully give them. Quiet. I say uh, it's more important that it actually has a real network of people building, and there are people building on Bitcoin. It's just that they don't all congregate. Did you Bitcoin did you channel, use right? Bitcoin like, within the last twenty four you know, hours? Yeah, I did. Okay, I didn't. So I go on stage. I, made, I, made payment. I, made, I do little um, I do little um, test payments here and there just because okay. I like Lightning Network as well. So I'll All go right. to a web. Cool. Yes, I'll make a Lightning payment just to yeah. do the yeah. paywall. And um, I mean, my role is a little different because obviously I'm a podcaster in the day, so I try to stay up on using Bitcoin and some of the different technologies and so on. But, yeah, um, and I'm doing a presentation at the Bitcoin Sydney meetup tomorrow night about Lightning Network as well. Cool. So I'll be talking about the Bitcoin works out great. recently yeah. in Berlin. I, I, I so like the Lightning technology. I, think, I hope it works great. I think it's going to take a little while, but I hope yeah, it gets so, there. And I think yeah, it'll so make everything better that, for everyone too. So, so Sorry? let's... I think Lightning, when it works well, will make everything better for everyone because it's open source technology and we all use similar addressing systems with BIP39. And so like it will help Bitcoin and a lot of other things, and I, I believe that will make the world a better place. Like I, I support Lightning. Particularly, that's although it, I think they would need to be Bitcoin like, right? Like Bitcoin or Litecoin, sure, etc. Everything, um, everything is. Everything is Bitcoin right. like. Like I, I wanted to create and a bunch of Ethereum that, addresses, yeah, and I used a liquidity, Bitcoin right? tool to do it. Say again. But it comes with liquidity as well, right? So the other way I think of it is, even if you have Lightning Network on some of the shit coins, ultimately. You need you need to be transacting on the one that actually has liquidity, actually has channels on it, has uh, pathways through which you can route on the Lightning Network. So Litecoin's Lightning Network, for example, is much smaller than Bitcoin's Lightning Network. That's a fact, right? And so hold again, on one second. Even what, then, what is smaller than Lightning's would... network? Light Litecoin's uh, Lightning Network is much smaller than oh, Bitcoin's sure. Lightning Network. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. I didn't even know they had a Lightning so Network. The point I'm getting to there is fundamentally people will want to transact in the most marketable money. So again, bring it back to economics, right? It's the economics of it and that there is a liquidity benefit. As I've demonstrated yeah. to you with the coinmarketbook.cc so, so site, yes. there is fundamentally I, and truthfully, factually, more liquidity yep. there. So, so let's talk, I, let's I talk about liquidity. I don't accept your argument about, oh, you put some stomp coin. I think sure. it's just let's fundamentally you're liquidity. pointing at the wrong thing to present this view that the, our Bitcoin's failing when actually Bitcoin's going from strength to strength, in my view. I, I, have, I have annihilated everything else so harshly that yes, the last remaining thing is the liquidity, which Bitcoin is the king of. 
hundred percent. If you need to place a hundred million dollar sell order and get it filled, you're going to do way better getting that filled on Bitcoin than any other cryptocurrency period. I believe that, right? I believe in the order book thickness. I believe that it has the best regulatory certainty. I believe that it has the best counterparties with CME in the United States. I, I, I believe that um, the developers are smart and they work hard. There's a lot of really good things about Bitcoin, which is why it's the biggest bag I hold, right? I, I believe in all that. Now let's talk about how important liquidity really is, okay? You sent a couple test transactions and some lightning transactions. I got to think that the amount of liquidity that it would like be required in the system to support you as a user is maybe $20, right? And I think what you'll find is since only 2.8 million wallets have $1,000 in them, that the vast, 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 vast majority of users, in fact, don't need much liquidity at all because they're not placing giant orders at all, which means they don't mind the bid-ass spread and they're not going to get a lot of slippage, right? So it's fun to brag about that. And I do brag about it when I'm when I go on stage to support Bitcoin and say nice things about it, which I just did in Malta, right? I just called out fake Satoshi on stage and, and let everyone know what a fraud he was and let people know who the real Bitcoin was and protect it against attackers inside and out. I'm more than happy to do that. I'm also a realist. So I don't let other people say un, untrue things about the currency to help it or to hurt it, right? I, I, I like the realistic perspective. Sure, but I You don't, don't think, need um, liquidity. You don't need it, and truthfully, I don't need it, and holders don't need it because they're not even transacting, they're not even selling. So this idea no, that I somehow the liquidity... I think you're totally wrong there. I'm sorry. Bro, if you're a holder, oh, you're not explain. selling. What are you talking about? That's the definition of holding. Let me explain. So there is a fundamental, like if you read Ludwig von Mises' Theory of Money and Credit, there's a specific section, I can't remember it exactly off the top of my head, but he's saying essentially it's there. there might be different media of exchange and there will be fundamentally different degrees of saleableness. And this, uh, let me just see, see if I can find the exact quote. Here it is, here it is. Okay, so he's saying there would be an in inevitable tendency for the less marketable of the series of goods used as media of exchange to be one by one rejected until at last only a single commodity remained, which was universally employed as a medium of exchange in a word, money. Okay, so what he's getting at there is he's suggesting that you know, even if there's a slight liquidity advantage for one coin over another, it will it will self-reinforce to the point where the more liquid one wins. And that is why that is the most that's important not, thing when we talk true. about the saleableness of Bitcoin and why Bitcoin is superior to all of the shit coins is Do it has that. And <laughs> no, what, why does it have that? Because yeah. fundamentally, it's got a real uh, oh, long-term uh, built-up uh, stability <laughs> to it, and it's building over time. So, so that's fundamentally how I would think of it. Okay. But what's you, your view? So you just stabbed yourself either in the back or the front with your own argument again. Go on. So you say liquidity matters, yes? Yes. Okay, and you say the most liquid coin wins, yes? Okay, so let me explain that. It's longer term, I think. <laughs> yeah. Because again. Start that hedging, bro. Back, Move that goalpost, man. I'm ready. Well, I'm trying to explain it in a way that's like, uh, you know, I can't like hedge every, I can't explain every little complexity, right? This the is this I is a big it, thing. This is not a small thing, but but I'll let you to do your thing. Go ahead. Liquidity matter, long-term liquidity is where we left off. Yeah, right. But what I'm getting at there is I'm not saying necessarily Bitcoin goes to 100%, everything else goes to zero overnight. I'm saying longer term, that is the tendency we would expect to see. Whether the final, whether not that there's ever a final state of the market, but it's it's likely that it's going to be winner takes most if not winner takes all now there may be some other you know if you think like 80 20 Pareto, right then eight bitcoin maybe bitcoin takes like that 80 or 85 percent 90 percent whatever and then there'll be a bunch of shit coins in that five or ten percent whatever that little leftover bit is right are you just I describing don't... gresham's law to me or like i mean so Actually, I'm describing more like Thea's law here. So Thea's okay. law is the, think of that like the opposite of Gresham's law. So, so Gresham's law is often incorrectly stated as bad money drives out good. But the actual correct, uh, if you want to get more precise about it, is actually when one, value, one money is artificially overvalued by the government relative to another. That's actually what, hap what drives that Gresham's law result. And it is, in fact one specific example of a generalized problem with price controls of when imposed by the government. Now, Thea's law is more like the other way around. It's like good money drives out bad. 
and you, we can think of that more just like what would happen thing. in a world where there was no legal tender laws, right? And so this it kind of brings back to the Austrian economics argument around why legal tender laws can be so bad for society is because they can enable the government to push everyone onto a fiat money standard as opposed to commodity so, money standard, which is what okay, we had in on. the past. I have to jump in because we've gone so far deep here. One, those two laws are actually equal one looks at what's money, the money that is, it's just a framing error. Gresham's law states that bad money drives out good if you look at the money that's in use because people would rather hold the good money and use the shit money. And it requires a peg, as you said, which requires, yes. which introduces a mispricing. However, if you stop looking at what's left in the market and you look at what the person prefers to hold, then good money drives out bad in his wallet, but bad money drives out good in the market. Right, so they're, they're both they're both the same statement. It's just whether you're looking at what's in the market or what's on the the holder's wallet. Right. Um, further, legal tender laws in the United States did not drive out other currencies. You can pay in whatever the fuck you want. You can pay in euros if you want. You can pay in Visa, PayPal dollars if you want. You can pay in Bitcoin if you want. You can pay in gold if you want. You can pay in your silver if you want. It's, it didn't. That is not the effect that that making legal tender laws had whatsoever. So, so can we? So we went really deep down that path, but we, we kind of left the door open and, and didn't handle the door, which was, you say liquidity matters, and you say the most liquid coin should win, which is why Bitcoin's better than all the shit coins because it's more liquid, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, Go now on. I'm going to curb stomp your argument. What's more liquid, Bitcoin or the U.S. dollar? So again, I foresaw that that wasn't sure. an unknown uh, objection in my well, view. Well, right? then like you could have we could have skipped this whole thing, and you could have avoided bringing up the liquidity argument because now I'm going to use your argument against you, right? So you're using the bigger liquidity is better, so shit coins suck, and I'm going to use the same exact thing, and that's why USD is better than Bitcoin. And now you've got to retract the argument and stop using it because it's a bad argument, which is your argument. No, I it's think a bad of argument. it more like. I think of it more like it's a combo thing. It's liquidity plus having a censorship resistant thing aspect of it. Cash right? is censorship because resistant. Obviously the US, the dollar, US dollar is more censorship resistant than Bitcoin. You'll lose that one too. Uh, no. That's, yes. I'm sorry. That's, no, that's, that's, that's straight up wrong. I, I disagree with that. Sorry. What are you talking about? Why do you think drug users the use the US dollar to launder all their fucking money and they don't use Bitcoin because it works better? Vastly better. Well, and it has more liquidity. Are there AML and sanctions laws? Are there FATCA and CRS laws? Are there tax reporting laws? Also, <laughs> these laws that exist within the US so you think... world. <laughs> if you're operating in a Bitcoin context, those things, and again, if you're operating in a, what I call a na Bitcoin native context, right? Obviously, you're not leaving your Bitcoins at the bank, right? At an exchange, then FATCA so and we, AML so... and sanctions on, and all these rules so don't sort of apply to you in that sense they they also don't apply to human beings transacting cash with each other all right in australia they do because they passed extra laws that says you can just not give this much cash to someone else anywhere but in the united states that's not the fucking case if you want to give someone two hundred thousand dollars cash for their house you can walk up to them and hand them two hundred thousand dollars cash for their house period all right so in the united states the things that you're saying they are not true they're inaccurate you're saying things that are false and i'm pointing it out to you U.S. dollar is more anonymous than Bitcoin is. When you use Bitcoin, you leave a trail. When you use cash, there ain't no fucking trail, right? Which is the Sorry, reason. When I said, I, but I, hold on, I said censorship resistant, not anonymous, right? I mean, when you use the U.S. dollar, somebody can censor your transaction. No, they can't. If you want to send it digitally. No. Oh, digitally. Well, guess what? There's enough liquidity in just the printed dollars to exceed your market cap anyway. So we don't have to talk about digitally. You're losing the liquidity argument. You're losing the anonymity argument. You're losing the censorship resistant argument. They just also happen to have so much extra liquidity in their non-censorship resistant part. And to tell you the truth, actually sending wires appears to be pretty fucking censorship resistant because everyone that gets scammed with romance frauds and 419 Nigerian scams, they don't get their fucking money back. That money stays gone and the scammers get to keep it. So I'm not exactly sure why you think that there's not censorship resistance in the US dollar in wire transfers when the scammers get to keep all the fucking money they steal anyway. I mean, isn't it obvious that it's censorship resistant because the criminals get to keep the money? It's very obvious. <laughs> Curb, no, stomping, everything you say, all of it. Except no, the shit I agree on. No, I do agree on some. No, not really. I, I think, I, I don't think that's right. Like fundamentally, it's, it's more about a longer term case here, right? As in what if you want an alternative to the US dollar and if you want an alternative, then this is, this is the alternative. 
Now, I'm not saying that Bitcoin necessarily wins that battle. I think it will, but it's not like preordained in the galaxy or in the stars or whatever like that, right? Whereas you're seeming to say, like, I think there's a bit of a conflation here, right? Because you're saying, oh, yeah, so Stefan, you said liquidity matters overall. And I say, well, yeah, amongst the cryptocurrencies, right? Amongst oh, the okay, so, cryptos. Oh, okay. So can, you, so can you explain to me why liquidity matters in crypto, but liquidity... You're... I don't want right, to belabor this. Let me try. Let me I don't, try I don't want to belabor this again. The, the, no. Okay, go ahead. So, look, it's it's think of it more like it's liquidity plus certain other things, right? Plus okay. certain other components of Bitcoin or characteristics of Bitcoin that set it far above and ahead right. every other so, uh, cryptocurrency. Uh huh. Okay. So, can I ask you right, why right, and, why shitcoins do more transaction volume and have higher market caps and why the Bitcoin price dropped 85% even though it's so fucking awesome? Because, it's so okay, awesome. So a few things. The, the market cap point around, okay, it dropped 85%, etc. Bitcoin is moving in waves. And I'm sure you understand that as well, right? You and I've your listeners, I'm sure you know this is, a, this is a seasonal thing, right? Like this is, mm -hmm. we have waves of adoption. We have big groups of people who come in. And because again, it's not, it's not like... It's not like that the people just knew about Bitcoin and they all just steadily adopted it along the way. It, it, people move in momentum trading, right? Okay. So they, they sort of see it moving up and then they all chase it, right? Because it's FOMO, right? That's a different okay. thing. So why, why, right? why do less people accept Bitcoin now than they did a couple of years ago? Why is that going the because wrong direction? Was, well, in 2013 and 14, there was this whole merchant adoption thing and like, oh, okay, you need to... Uh, you know, we need to all go shout at a merchant and tell them to take Bitcoin and right. But my view on that is more like it won't make sense for a lot of these people to uh, actually take Bitcoin until their own expenses are in Bitcoin as well. So then they mm -hmm. can actually close that loop. So mm -hmm. actually what makes more sense is holding for now. And over time, yes, it needs to get built out. And I think we're seeing this now with companies like BitRefill who are doing lightning payment and you can buy vouchers and things with lightning or Bitcoin of a lightning network. And um, so we're seeing that happen, but fundamentally, coming back to that network effects point, it's speculation. Holders, they are what provide the reservation demand for Bitcoin. It's the yes, holders. Yes, I, I, I love, I love that a peer-to-peer, -peer, I love that a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system has its primary use case as non-use. I think that's pretty funny. Well, it depends what you mean by use. In my view, hodling <laughs> is a use. I mean hodling like opening the client and entering a number and hitting like send or like watching your balance go up and like receiving some shit that's use that's i mean because if people didn't do that really what what, what utility would the currency have at some point well, whatever extra value you've accrued from holding right has so to Richard, actually do you translate. disagree then do you disagree that hodling is using i i agree that hodling is using if and only if something that isn't hodling occurs at some point in the future so yes, oh, you can, sure. you can like accrue it. value. You can. I, I I love the store of value. I believe store of values are worth more than transactional networks. That's the reason gold's worth nine trillion, and Visa plus PayPal plus Mastercard, uh, you know, plus all the other credit card processing companies aren't don't add up to a tenth of it. So I'm for the store of value uh, argument, right? I'm for the the holding and making mad gains, and it's what my currency that I built is built to do. It's built to do something Bitcoin can't do. In Bitcoin, the only new coins are given to miners. And the only thing the miners do with them are sell them on market to push the price down, to pollute the environment with pollution. Now, is that required in Bitcoin? Yes, because it is a security model. The security model is proof of work and proof of work can only be trusted if it is wasteful, period. So that's how it works, right? Now, could we reduce the waste? Yes, we could. And how do I know that? Because lots of other networks are transacting lots of volume with no problems, billions and billions and billions of dollars, and they're doing it with less waste. Because in fact, all the Bitcoin mining network is, is a protection racket. The only people that could attack you through the 51% hash attack vector are the same miners that you're paying the fees to. And they're saying, oh, it'd be a pity if your transaction was rolled back, isn't it, right? Mafia style. Now back in the old days when it was CPU and GPU, anyone could have attacked the network and could have been financially incented to do so because anyone could be turned into a miner because there was so much hardware out there. But now that it's SHA-256-ASICs only, 
And now there's only four or five companies in the world you could possibly buy them from and even attempt to be cash positive doing so. You're really paying a protection racket to these guys. And what have they done with the money? Well, what Bitmain did with the money is they made a fake copy of Bitcoin that they promoted as the real Bitcoin and then took all of that money and all that economic, economic energy that the good, wholesome, honest Bitcoin miners gave them and stabbed them right in the back and made the emergency down target, try to the emergency difficulty retarget, try and take all the miners away from Bitcoin and kill real Bitcoin and have covert ASIC boost in there so that they keep getting outsized returns on their miners, right? That's what really happened, okay? That's what really happened with a proof of work safety ecosystem is that we have now a fraudulent copy impersonating the real one uh, it, to no one's benefit that I can see, right? So I don't think, I think miners are overpaid. I think it's security theater. I think it's a protection racket. And I think a lot of other currencies are transacting a lot of volume with no problems whatsoever and that those miners are overpaid. Now on Ethereum, I can get a non-rollbackable transaction with a more diverse, more robust network of GPU miners that aren't these four or five centralized groups of horror that have taken over Bitcoin, okay? You know, when I first got into Bitcoin, I double clicked the EXE and Bitcoin came into my computer for free, 50 block reward, 50 BTC block reward every time I found a block with no pool. That's when I got it, that's when I started. So then I said, you know what, I, I like this. And then I went all in with a lot of money, right? Helped make the $30 top. Well, guess what? Uh, now you don't have any freemium onboarding for users anymore because no one will give up the coins for free. There's no free mining. So what happens? Now people get freemium onboarded to Monero or freemium onboarded to Raven because you can GPU mine it. And then all those guys that would have became buyers and would have been onboarded into the ecosystem and had speculative stickiness to have a reason to stay engaged, right? They're not here anymore, which is why the chat rooms are dead, which is why the memes are dead, which is why I don't even post on the Reddit. I don't even bother posting there. It, it's that bad, right? I love Twitter. I think crypto Twitter is amazing. I think crypto Twitter is vibrant, both the Bitcoin one and the altcoin one. So I'm definitely a fan of the Twitter. Um, so like, I want censorship resistant peer to peer money that appreciates in value. I want people to have security in the future, the future price that things are going to have. And I invented the first cryptocurrency in the world to have a chart of future market supply, not total supply. The 1% of Bitcoin that's owned by the Winklevoss twins, the 1% of Bitcoin that's owned by the plus token Ponzi schemers, the 1.4% of Bitcoin that's owned by, uh, Mount Gox trustee, the 1% uh, the of Bitcoin that's owned by Tim Draper, all of those guys could dump on your head and shit on the price whenever they want and cut it in half. Any one of those guys could cut the price in half like that. And if they told you when they were gonna sell their coins, you wouldn't believe them because you would think they were lying. It's not in their best interest. My system is the first system to have a truth engine where the inflation is only paid to the stakers who declare how long they're gonna hold and you have a chart of future market supply. Not total supply, market supply. You know when people can sell their coins because you know when their stakes are ending. And then you can time your own stakes to be when a giant whale isn't ending stake and it reduces volatility and it, and it addresses a larger market than Bitcoin address. We do everything Bitcoin does, more secure, lower fees, better user interface, right? The GUI interface in, in Bitcoin Core is garbage. It doesn't even sign BC1 transactions. If you want to sign from a BC1 address, from a native SegWit BIP30, uh, uh, BEC32 address, Dash you can't even do it. It's not even supported, but it's supported in Electrum. All right, so let me respond to the point here. So again, I think you like it just becomes a bit of a... A little bit of a shell game here like you just keep kind of throwing these other little ideas around like oh my coin's more secure lower fees da -da -da. it is but, and also every erc20 is the other thing is I, every erc20 so is cheaper is, to transact I, I i wouldn't say more secure at all i do not think other erc20s okay, are more secure so that's, than bitcoin. So that's a change then but anyway the point is i i think you're, you're judging bitcoin by only bitcoin core as well i think there are some very smooth uh wallets and worse. other um interfaces that uh that exist today such as you know you can you you can get say zap wallet on lightning and that's a really great wallet well, i you love electrum that electrum's amazing on chain i love electrum electrum yeah amazing. or electrum yeah sure yeah, electrum's a great example yeah. and, I, and think, it works but, I mean more electrum, than one maybe currency. it's a bit more of a power user tool but uh, it's still a great wallet Dude, i so like easy. it i advocate it as well yeah um but, i still here's I what's fucked up i still like bitcoin like i really do truly still like bitcoin and go on stage and say only positive things about it when i went to malta I said only positive things about Bitcoin. There's a lot of good shit here that we can talk about. 
but it's not good for Bitcoin to pretend that competition doesn't exist. It's not good for Bitcoin to think that 2.8 million users mm. will over a thousand dollars. And am I pretending good. competition doesn't exist or am I simply stating that there are certain aspects of vectors along which that competition won't beat Bitcoin, for example, the liquidity. Right. And so, the other point I, I, I get a bit frustrated is when I see this whole, I like Bitcoin, now buy my shitcoin kind of view. I, I'm sure I you do get frustrated by that. Yep. I, you, know what I, you know what I get frustrated by? I like Bitcoin and I won't actually do anything to make it better. I get frustrated by that. So my well, path, my path of taking responsibility for the quality of the currency leads to people improving it. Your path of saying everything's fucking great and not only great, but actually the best in the world leads to people shoving their thumbs up their ass and holding because that's the best thing they can do. Which is why everyone has their thumbs up their ass. Holding is a great thing they can do. But I, I actually do educate people, help educate or help build on the, on the, arc, on the system as well. And now everyone plays their different role. So some people have the role of being a hodler. Some people have the role of being a developer. Some people have the role of making other applications that operate on top of Bitcoin. That's, that's the so way it works. So let's talk about this. Think... What, what applications yeah. are built on top of Bitcoin? Lightning? Okay. BitMEX? Okay. Like wallets. What else? Wallets. Uh, yeah, I, I, like I think of it fundamentally is about holding for now. They're the, they're the most important things right now. But longer term, yes, I think people will build other financial Do you know holding on doesn't Bitcoin, onboard new users, users man? Do you, you know will. holding so doesn't onboard for new example. users? Sorry? You understand that holding does not onboard new users. Indirectly it does because it provides, again, that that overall reservation demand, which is what attracts more people into it longer term, right? So yes, you'll, you can say, oh, look, Bitcoin dropped 85%. And yes, you're right. <laughs> it's but sad. again, this is the wave thing. This is an adoption waves thing. So uh, that to me isn't a big deal because we, we've seen that we've seen that before. We'll see it again, right? We, we'll see another big, you know, we'll likely see another big bull run and we'll see another crash just again. And then, you know, the mainstream sure. media will come out but and say, oh, look, Bitcoin is dead. Right. And it'll so let's, be let's try something. Let's, let's try something different. So we've, we've talked about Bitcoin a lot, right? Yep. I have done the minimum to actually talk about my thing. Like I, I, I haven't told you about any of the game. Oh, theory. I don't know. I think, I think you kind of subtly inject these little points about, oh, hex this, hex better. Well, that. It shouldn't be subtle. Um, it should be, it should be very clear. Cause I'm trying to make you rich. I'm trying to give you something better than what you have now for free. I'm working really hard to improve your life and give you what you want for free. For free if you want to dox their privacy for it though. Do explain that to me. Explain the doxing to me. Didn't you, didn't you, wouldn't, you, wouldn't a user to claim Hex have to dox some components of their UTXO set to Hex? I, I don't understand what you mean by dox. Do you mean like there's a public blockchain that shows that certain people have certain balances, right? That's what a blockchain is? Yes. Okay. Right. And they would have to reveal to you or to whoever's running Hex which UTXOs they hold. So, so let me, let me explain what happens and then you tell me where the security hole is. Okay. Got it. Let's say you have one address, one Bitcoin address and you install Tor browser and you install MetaMask and then you go onto the wallet website and you say, here's my Bitcoin address and you click claim and it says, sign this, you hit copy, you paste it in your wallet, you click sign. You copy the signature, you paste it there, you click submit, and you're done. Finished. Your coins are in your wallet. Now, in order for that to happen, you had to have a penny or two of Ethereum in your wallet, or someone else would have had to forward your transaction for you. We support both things, right? So now what have we done? We already know that there is an address that has a Bitcoin balance that's public over here on the Bitcoin blockchain. And now the new piece of information we got is that that address over there claim some hex at an ETH address over here. So these two addresses are tied together now, but that's it. No one knows your IP. I don't have IP logs, right? You use Tor. So where's the, where's the doxing? There's no AML KYC. There's no, there's no doxing. Now, if you wanted to fuck up and create some virtual doxing, if someone really wanted to look into you, right? Then you would like claim all your Bitcoin addresses to one ETH address. Don't do that. For every BTC address you want to claim, make a new ETH address and click the Tor circuit, give me a new circuit. And then you've got a new circuit and a new ETH address for everyone your Bitcoin addresses. And you're as anonymous as you entered, as, as long as Tor works, which I believe it does. It's like industry standard, best anonymity you can actually get in the world currently. So like, I don't understand this whole, like, I'm going to dox myself. Furthermore, do you know how much free money was given to Bitcoin holders? 
that involved vastly more doxing and made people millions and millions of dollars? BCH, which had you install a fucking client that wasn't audited, that had access to your real private keys. They did that, right? Even though that was the dumbest, most horrible thing they did, and I wrote the guide that included using a virtual machine to make sure they couldn't steal your fucking keys, uh, it still went fine. Nobody got hacked, right? XRP, give your email address. We ain't getting your email address. Totally optional. You don't got to put your email address in. If you want to put it in because you want to get an email when something cool happens, great. But if you don't want to, who gives a shit? I mailed, I mailed the list for the first time. So, like, go ahead. So are you assuming then that everyone is going to do the correct procedure there? That they're not going to accidentally link up their addresses all into one? I, I think one that the vast majority happening. of users doesn't care about that security whatsoever, and they don't even use Tor in their Bitcoin client. And if you don't even use Tor in your Bitcoin client, then you're already doxed off the bat because it can see what node got that transaction first, right? Like the, the amount of people that actually care about Bitcoin security is fucking zero. They don't even bother to take their coins off exchange. So I tell everyone how to do it. And I know that most people won't do it because indeed they don't give a fuck. And there, you could make a strong case that they shouldn't bother giving a fuck because in the history of Bitcoin, really, who has been attacked through that doxing vector? Nobody, not even the darknet guys. The darknet guys all fuck up their OPSEC on a side channel and their, their proxy stops working and they log in directly from their cable modem, right? Or their server gets uh, zero dayed, right? No one has ever actually got fucked up for using Bitcoin from the chain analysis perspective. Everyone that's gotten fucked up for Bitcoin because I read all the indictments, they get fucked up from something else they messed up. Like, like people say Bitcoin's not confiscatable, right? Tone Vase likes to talk that shit a lot. It's not confiscatable. Well, that's real funny because I see it for auction at the government auction all the time from confiscating it. So one of you motherfuckers is wrong. And I think since I'm watching the auctions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that it is confiscatable. Oh, but let me hedge it. Actually, I'm lying to you and it really is confiscatable. But, but it's not confiscatable via this way that, you know, okay. A lot of hedging and a lot of bullshitting going on for people trying to pump their bags when this thing is actually already awesome. Bitcoin is actually already awesome. It works really well and went from zero to 20,000 and still has 10x larger market cap than the next thing. It's still fucking great, but you don't have to lie about it, right? So what you just said everyone's going to dox themselves for claiming well, shit. And I'm saying, I'm saying that no one has had any well, problems doxing themselves from taking all those other free coins like Lumens, like XRP, like BCH, like BSV, four or five of the other top 10 fucking cryptos are given away for free. I got my Bitcoin for free, but now you're trying to make it so other people don't take that free money. That's not ethical, actually, right? People need money. Well, Some people no, are I, fucking broke. I think, I think it's... I Sorry. think of it like I'm just be trying to get current big holders of Bitcoin on because you want it one side, so you're giving it to them for free, mm -hmm. and you're kind of selling a bit of a false promise here about oh my coin is more secure and therefore long term, you know. The new I, I will send you my audits that Bitcoin doesn't have. I spent sixty thousand dollars on audits. Bitcoin spent zero dollars on audits. So if yes, I take my $60,000 that I gave good. experts in security auditing my software. I will publish that. And then you guys publish your audits that you spend $0 on because you don't fucking have any. Like how, like how dare you like if accuse me? Audits, it's not... You're breaking up. Again. Say again. Like you're going to get the audits done. Like what kind of system is that? I, all I heard was you're going to get the audits done. What kind of system is that? I think I missed something. I'm saying what kind of if you can like centrally who is on the on the coin or whatever. The the business of auditing software is very small and the auditors that do good work are very known and they publish the tools that they build to audit things and they get peer reviewed and papers get written about them. So for instance, one of our auditors that's tied for the best auditor in the world for solidity contracts is Chain Security. And Chain Security wrote a tool called Varex, which lets you like deterministically prove things about smart contracts that didn't exist before. The other company, which we didn't use, I would call Trail of Bits, and you can review their work auditing all types of software from all types of venues because they're very good at it. The other company that we use is Coin Fabric out of Argentina, who uh, their team kind of works with the RSK guys who's trying to release something like Ethereum on Bitcoin, right? Like I think one of their co-founders was Sergio Lerner. And if you know anything about Bitcoin, you know about Sergio Lerner, right? Yeah, so look, and then funding audit. Are you personal funding it or is there some kind of developer? No, I, I paid for it with my money. How is that? Uh, I paid for the audit with my money. That's how that worked. And then 
isn't actually any other like, uh, reward. Your connection is fucked again for some reason. Um, usually I can like tease out what you're saying from like half. Hey. Do you yeah, want to try? Yeah, can you want to try just hitting? Do you, yeah. So there's two things that you're gonna want to look at, right? You hear me now? Yeah, I, I can hear you good enough. I mean, all I needed to hear was founders reward, and I can just fill in the rest, right? So there's two things that you're gonna care about if you're looking for founders rewards. One, there's an origin address that get copy of bonuses. If you get in the first day, you get a twenty cent bonus. The origin address gets a copy of it. If you refer somebody, you get a twenty percent bonus. Origin address gets a copy. If you get referred, you get a 10% bonus. Origin address gets a copy. Um, if you emergency end your stake, half of it goes to the origin address on the penalties and half of it goes to the stakers that stayed staked. If you don't end your stake within two weeks of when you said you should, you start incurring late penalties, then half that penalty goes to the stakers, half that penalty goes to the origin. So it gets bonuses. Doesn't get anything on your claim, your base claim of 10,000 hex per, uh, per BTC and it doesn't get anything on interest. If you stake your coins, you get interest, it ain't getting none of that, right? So there's that. And then there's also ability to onboard to the ecosystem by transforming Ethereum into Hex, which is very similar to how EOS did it. They raised $4.2 billion that way. You would send Ethereum, they give you EOS at the end of the day. Two buckets, one bucket full of the coin, in this case, Hex, and another empty bucket. People put Ethereum into that bucket. If you're 10% of the ETH bucket, you get 10% of the Hex bucket. Buckets empty, new day, empty hex, uh, empty ETH bucket, here's your hex. If you're 20% of the ETH that day, you get 20% of the hex, new day. That happens for 351 days. Very similar to how uh, EOS did it, where they did it for uh, 350 days. They're cycled every 23 hours, our cycles every 24 hours. So those are the two things that you're worried about in regards to someone having a lot of it. Does that answer your question? Got it. Yeah, no, okay, so got it. So uh, I, I just think... So should we talk about should we talk about whether it's good for there to be a large bag holder or not? You might dump on your head, right? Sure. You might, you might dump the price that? on you, right? So this currency prevents people from surprise dumping the price by diluting them and paying everyone else that's staked and locked up all of the inflation in the system. So in, ha in, in Bitcoin, it took 10 years to get down to 4% inflation. After the first year, HEX will have a maximum of 3.69%. And that took Bitcoin 10 years to get to that, right? And inflation in HEX is nothing like inflation in Bitcoin because we don't have externalities. We don't pay miners block rewards. We don't pay a miner inflation. Miners just get a few pennies of fees. That's all they get. So we don't have miners constantly pushing the price down all the time with, with their block rewards, which is what you do have in Bitcoin. So, which means that if you're an average length, average size staker, there is no inflation to you because the inflation is being given to you, which means it's actually 0% inflation, less if people lose their coins and keys, right? Whereas in Bitcoin, you have real inflation that really gets sold on the market because people have electricity bills to pay. We have all-time high difficulty, but we don't have all-time high price, which causes extra selling pressure because they don't have the privilege of holding. They've got bills to pay, right? Furthermore, since we are the currency, that pays you to stake and publicly declare when you can sell your coins, I would be very surprised if people that had large bags of this currency didn't lock it up. And if they didn't lock it up, then you would see it on the chart that they didn't, and you would know to be scared. Maybe they can dump. Now this system, it, it, it does things and gives you truth about the future market supply that no other cryptocurrency has ever had. Because masternode coins and staking coins, you can end the stakes whenever you want, you can close the node whenever you want, and you can dump the price. No certainty, right? Gox could say he's selling all the coins tomorrow at market. He could do that. I, don't, I wouldn't like that. I, I would hate that, but he could do it, right? And it's what he did in, in 2018. He dumped 40K coins. Didn't tell anyone about it. He did that, right? He dumped 40K BCH and 40K BTC. Well, um, you know, I built something to solve all those problems. So of all the currencies in the world that could be accused of like, oh, somebody's gonna dump on me, that's a whale. You're like, no, we built this currency to stop that from happening. We, we penalize whales 75%. I told you that 40% of all Bitcoins held in addresses over a thousand. We penalize those guys 50% of their stack, up to 75% of their stack if they uh, have se over 10K coins, which is a lot of wallets, a lot. So it turns out after all the penalties and stuff, you can only claim about one third of these coins. <clears throat>
Okay. All right. So look, I think it's one of those things where look, okay, Richard, you're a smart guy, right? Like, you know, you're a smart guy. You're very good at like, um, kind of engineering this system, right? But my yeah. view is, I think actually a lot of these things are kind of over-engineered, right? And it's it's well, like maybe. how are you gonna how? But like, they end after a year. People... They all end so after a year. People... So there's Sorry? no more claiming after a year. There's no more referral program after a year. There's no more uh, speed bonus after a year. Almost all of the amazing game theory goes away after the first year. And all you're left with is we pay stakers instead of miners and we inflate it at a maximum of 3.69% a year. And that gets pushed far out into the future because it's only realized when people end their stakes and mint the rewards. So like we have well, extremely, after the first year, we have extremely low inflation and none of that exciting crap I just explained to you. <clears throat> right. So I think, yeah. So again, I think it just, it's going to, it's not going to have what, and now maybe you would disagree with this and you wouldn't like that argument. They'll have no liquidity when it starts. It, They'll have no liquidity, well, no one will accept it anywhere. I think it's also kind of one way to explain it is like that uh, quoting about immaculate conception of Bitcoin, right? Because it got formed at this time when there wasn't a whole sway, the industry of shitcoiners who wanted to scam people who had just like, you know, had this incentive to print money, right? To print their own money. So instead of that, people can more easily place their uh, trust or their uh, investment into something like Bitcoin compared to Hex because fundamentally they know that it, it was made at a time when there wasn't this whole, you know, cottage industry of starting your own shitcoin. So <laughs> I was there, like, I don't know when you got into Bitcoin. There's a likelihood that I got into it before you, you know. I mined it yep, back sure. when it was a dollar. I bought heavy when it was 30 and watched that shit go down to a penny, which I wasn't very excited about, but I was so rich at the time. It didn't, didn't really matter that much. Um, and like, I, I love that so many people are willing to buy my bags at like 8K and such when I bought them at 30. I think it's fabulous. I love it. I hope they go up to 800K, right? Like, it, I love it. But I don't think that I'm actually a better person because I got in earlier. And I know a lot of other people that got in earlier and then they got out. And then getting in early didn't matter to them because they got in and they got out and they didn't get any appreciation, right? So like appeals to age, I don't care about. Appeals to wealth, I really don't care about. What I care about is censorship resistance, price appreciation, security, onboarding millions of users. Those are the things I care about, right? And I see a lot, I see millions of people getting onboarded to scams because they get promised high rates of return and then the price goes to zero. So I would like to use similar tactics and similar advertisements with a trustless, verifiable, audited peer-to-peer -peer system so that you could have similar price appreciation without the damn dump at the end, without the exit scam, right? So imagine onboarding all of those millions of users that got the shit robbed out of them. Imagine that those same guys got onboarded with the same amount of wealth into something that didn't just die at the end, that was honest and fair and, and real, right? I got in and got to mine Bitcoin for free and I'm handing these coins out for free. And that reminds me of when people could have bought Bitcoin for a dollar. And I'm recreating that epic. I'm recreating that opportunity for people. I'm killing whales for people. I'm, I'm doing something that Bitcoin can't do. Bitcoin has time locking, but it can't do time, time deposits because the game theory only allows them to reward miners for paying electric companies. The game theory does not allow Bitcoin to reward holders and developers and evangelists for other good positive behaviors that help everyone and that's not a good thing that's a bad thing i have the opportunity as the founder of this to install game theory which rewards everyone for positive behavior if you refer people you get money if more people adopt after you you get more and that's fair because they brought more economic mass so we can inflate the currency a little bit to reward you for bringing that extra economic mass right we don't overpay the miners to go create a fake copy and try and kill the real thing we don't do any of that polluting stuff extra. We do it the minimum necessary. We still use proof of work. It's still an ERC-20. It's a, it's a hybrid proof of stake proof of work. So if you want inflation, you have to prove that you'd staked for a length or you had to prove that you had a Bitcoin address that had a balance at the snapshot. That's the proof of stake component. The proof of work component is the transactional one, right? So we're, we're transacting volume with lower fees, with audits, with um, free money given to Bitcoiners, with a referral program, with the same type of high interest reward, Ponzi style, scammy style sales pitches that people deeply desire, which is the reason they're onboarding to every other scam except Bitcoin. And we bring them in on that bullshit because it's mathematically correct. If you, if you were the only Bitcoin miner 
and you only had $1 invested in Bitcoin mining, you would get 3.8 or 3.9% of all of the Bitcoin coming out this next year. And since there's about 18 million coins, let's call it 4% on 18 million coins is what, like 50K coins or something? So let's say you're going to get 50K coins and you had a dollar of mining equipment. Well, that's real. That's real math. That's really how it would work if you were the only miner. That's how it worked when Satoshi was the only miner. But the market cap was much less. Zero, in fact. So, you know, in our math, the advertising that we can give for percentage returns that are mathematically accurate are, here's how much the big payday is at the end, all the unclaimed coins, times the adoption bonuses, which can up to 3x them, plus the inflation, plus the early late, uh, the early and late end stake penalties, you know, all of those bonuses. If you're the only staker, this is how much you're going to get from all those bonuses on, on day 353. And then the only way that number comes down, it's going to be a huge, massive, giant percent. And the only way that number comes down is other people stake on top of you. Just the same with Bitcoin mining. The only way you don't make every single new coin is if other Bitcoin miners start jumping on top of you and beating you up with difficulty by competing against you. And staking in our system works the same way. If, if too many people stake, then the rewards go down to a minimum of 3.69%. If you're an average length, average size staker, because we reward you 20% extra every year, extra year you stake, just like a CD in the real world. Someone had to build the CD of the digital blockchain realm. Someone had to build it. Bitcoin couldn't do it. You started to get time locking, but you can't pay anyone to lock, so they just get screwed. Someone had to build it, so I built it, and I'm giving it away for free to Bitcoin holders. For some reason, it's like really hard to give them free stuff, even though they already accepted tons of other free stuff that's in the top 10. <laughs> it's like, all right, you know, I'm, you know, whether you guys want to or not, I'm gonna try and make your lives better by building something that needs to exist. If you wanna replace everything in finance, you have to replace every product at the bank. And the bank doesn't primarily do currency. Money exchange houses primarily do currency. The bank primarily does credit cards, checking account, savings account, and time deposit. Time deposits are the top three product at the bank. And no one else is doing it except me. And I should be praised for that shit. All right, so here's why I disagree. So I think a couple things. So first of all, I think high level, I think you're essentially selling to your followers this kind of false promise, right? Because they feel like, oh, I missed out on Bitcoin on the $1 a days. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe I can get in at Hex and I can be an early adopter in Hex. And oh, look, isn't it cool if I get part mm -hmm. of this first year and there's all those fantastic sign up bonuses and referral bonuses and so on that you mentioned with the origin address and the transformation mm -hmm. and all of that. Yep. And fundamentally, it's just selling people this false dream. And, uh, you know, the view what, I have. What makes is more it false? Like, Why is it false? Because it, because I see no reason why Hex will outcompete Bitcoin. I see no okay. reason why that would occur. So, so in the top and ten coins, which ones do you think belong there? Basically, none. Okay. I think none of them will. As in, wait. So let me clarify. So belong there. I think yeah, sure. People can try them. Will to to suggest that they will actually outcompete Bitcoin in a real free market competition. I think that's. Okay. Extreme, so can, extreme, extreme, unlikely. Have you heard? So have you heard of BNB? Do they have a right to exist, quote unquote? Yeah, maybe. But do they? Mm -hmm. Will they actually outcompete Bitcoin? No. Reason okay. being, they are not meaningfully doing anything uh, that actually kind of matters to make better than to make them better than Bitcoin in some meaningful way. They're often just doing some kind of silly security trade-off against some other thing that Bitcoin, in some sense, bit the bullet on. Right? Bitcoin bites the bullet in certain ways to maintain a certain level of censorship resistance mm -hmm. that you know, in, you know and in truth some of this was more like a couple of years ago where more people would say stuff like oh i can do more transactions on train on chain etc whatever but i, I don't think i don't like high me, throughput the way coins. i'm doing this is more like not everything necessarily has to be done on chain on the bitcoin blockchain right financial services can be built on top of bitcoin without necessarily being on chain on-chain time deposits, for example. I think it might be more like we see Bitcoin is this native kind of bedrock thing that's at the very base layer of our coming financial system. And we need to imagine and envision a new financial system, but one where Bitcoin and Satoshis, right? It might be denominated in sats, right? And that is my view on what we will see. And people will build their products on top of that. So a quick example, on-chain capital, right? So on-chain capital, so Disclosure, they're a podcast sponsor of mine, but I mm -hmm. like their model. I genuinely think they have a good model that they offer people the ability to do two of three multi-sig with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And then, for example, if you want to put up 
collateral, put up Bitcoin as collateral, you can do that. Now you can get USD without selling your Bitcoin, right? So it's very, it's, it can be more tax efficient, right? So that's an example of a financial service that I think makes a little bit more sense and is being built like banking being built on top of Bitcoin rather than everything being natively done in the on the chain, so to speak, right? You, you that, just advertise like a counterparty with counterparty risk, right? Well, yeah, so, uh, okay. yes, so yes, yeah, yeah, there so is, yeah, I'm, there is still that risk. Right. I'm, I'm advertising something that doesn't have counterparty risk. It's trustless, trustless interest, no order book, no counterparty, no BitGo, no hardware key management, no HSM, no hardware security module, right? Real, truly trustless interest. If so you invest in that model, I'm curious, what's the security model then? Like for a holder of hex, how will they do they use a hardware wallet? Like sure. what is the yeah, we support how all do they that. keep it secure? Yeah. So if you like Trezor or Ledger, then you can leave your keys in those devices and sign natively with Trezor, your Bitcoin statement. If you're on Linux, you can sign natively with your uh, ledger. If you're on Windows, their app doesn't sign properly natively. So I suggest you use it through Electrum. So both both Ledger and Trezor and I believe cold card are supported through Electrum, which I believe is the best, the best Bitcoin wallet. So that's where your keys live and you can sign offline and you, then you can move your transaction from your key, your computer that has your keys or your hardware wallet that has your keys, they stay in it. You can move your signed statement over to your internet connected computer to then submit it through, you know, in your case, Tor um, and to a new Ethereum address with a new uh, onion route for every claim. So now uh, what happens when you free claim your hex? If you claim the first day, you get a 20% bonus. You get 10,000 hex per Bitcoin. You can claim a single Satoshi. I think you'll lose money on the fees because it's unlikely you're mining your own Ethereum block. You could if you wanted to. It's more likely that you're paying a penny or two of Ethereum to have someone else mine it for you. And you're the only one that can mint your coins. It's very important that you understand that no one else is giving you these coins. Just like a Bitcoin block reward that you mine yourself and create your own coins, hex operates the same way you create your own coins with that proof of stake proof of work hybrid that I told you about. So now what can you do with those coins? When you free claim, your coins are auto staked for a minimum of 350 days, 90%, 10% you can do whatever you want with. And you can choose on your auto stake, your 350 day minimum auto stake, you can choose to make it longer if you want more adoption bon or, or more free shares, more bonus shares. We have longer pays better and bigger pays better, just like a normal bank. And a normal bank and a normal city, the longer you lock your money, the more interest you get. You get about 20% more interest every extra year you lock. We give you 20% more shares every extra year you lock. And they also have jumbo CDs where you get about 10% more interest if you have over $100,000 in your account. We also have an equivalent to that where bigger pay better if you max it out, pays you about 10% more. And primarily that exists so people don't spam the network with smaller transactions. We prefer that there's an incentive to be efficient with the network and have larger transactions. Um, it also kind of emulates what masternodes have done with like minimum buy-ins, right? It gives people a target to aim for. So now you're auto-staked. And what does that mean? Your coins are actually burnt when they're auto-staked, which may be advantageous to you in a tax perspective because it may defer their, uh, they're hitting your like financial books till later. It depends on where you live. And then we keep track of those coins being burnt because we still need to inflate the currency knowing that they existed, right? Because otherwise there'd be no inflation rewards to give anybody if 100% of people staked, which wouldn't make any sense, right? And so now when the day 353 happens, or we'll, I mean, you're, if you claim first day, you're only gonna be staked till day 350 or 351. And you really wanna be staked for day 353 when the massive rewards and the massive payouts and all the unclaimed coins times the adoption multiplier get paid out, that stuff's worth about 50 to 100 times as much as the inflation is. So in the first year, we're really deciding who is gonna get the lion's share of the, of the currency. And people bid basically with longer stakes to get extra shares to receive a larger chunk of that giant payout at the end. And that's fair. If you believe more in the currency, you should get rewarded more than another guy. Right? If you're willing to delay gratification and hold, you should be rewarded more, just like you are investing periods in a startup or in CDs or bonds and treasuries in the real world. The longer you lock, the better you get paid. We're just emulating what already works in the real world in the blockchain. Now, what's the security model? Now, you have private keys that you generated in your Trezor or your Ledger, or if you just use MetaMask in the random number generator and MetaMask in your browser. And those private keys and the seed words that generated them have access to your funds. 
So as soon as you staked, as soon as you've claimed and you've got your auto stake and you've, you know, if you want to claim that extra 10%, I think you should do so. And now you can't send those coins anymore. They're locked and you've got the private keys and you can delete all those private keys off of all your devices. You can delete them off your computer and then your only place in the world where you've got your keys to access your money is your seed words that you've got written or printed on steel or sharded with Shamir secrets or like whatever you want to do with your private keys. You handle that how you want. And now that's it. So, okay, your stake's over. What do you want to do? You want to end your stake. Okay, you load your private keys up however you want or you move your treasure over to your computer and you click end stake and you pay your penny or two of Ethereum fees or maybe it's 10 cents at that time. Maybe it's a dollar. Maybe you roll, maybe you mine your own block and it's nothing for you, right? It just costs you electricity. It's up to you. And that's the security model, right? And, and other than that, it's just an ERC-20. So if, you're, if your coins aren't staked, you can just send them around like any other ERC-20. And you can, and you, the MetaMask supports Trezor and Ledger. Electrum supports Trezor and Ledger and Cold Wallet. Um, it's secure as fuck. Like, it's, it's really good. It only takes a minute to do all this. All this stuff I explained to you, it takes one minute. I got a YouTube video on youtube.com forward slash hex crypto. One minute and 24 seconds is all it takes for me to slowly describe to you how to import your keys, which you don't even have to do. But if, if you have a crappy wallet, like many people have, then you might need to import your keys to something that can sign. Import, claim, stake, minute and 24 seconds, talking slowly, right click copy, right click paste. Well, look, I, I ultimately I think it just it just becomes yeah I I don't do you like Monero too many of the coins. Do you like Monero? Being, no, not really. I don't Why think don't it's like a Monero? scalable thing. I think no. I I'm I'm more of a Bitcoin only guy myself. Why don't you like I Monero? I mean, it's anonymous. Them. Isn't that good? Uh, I sort of. I, I don't think it's really got the. Look, I think it's more like other people who want to try with it, fine, do it. I don't. I don't advocate it. I basically stay Bitcoin only. You know, Nick uh, Zabo likes it's... Monero, right? Oh, I mentioned it. That doesn't mean he likes it. He, right? he mentioned think, it yeah. very much that he likes it. It wasn't It wasn't a soft liking. It was a very hard liking. You could look it up if we want to quote well, him specifically. Fine. I, I, think that, I think ultimately it'll come back to which one is most liquid, right, of the cryptocurrencies. I think okay. people who want to play, you know, it's play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Mm -hmm. right? Have you heard I of BNB? People want to play. It. <clears throat> Sorry. Have you heard of BNB? It was an ERC twenty on Ethereum for a while. BNB. Uh, no idea. Binance. Nah. Have you heard of Binance? Oh yeah, BNB, the Binance yeah. coin. Yeah. How much do you yeah. think? Uh, how much do you think BNB is up over Bitcoin? Over the uh, the last eight hundred and forty days that it's existed. No, I don't. I don't check that. But okay. I think again, even if you wanted to do a proper comparison, there you would have to actually compare it against like the risk that you gambled on some other shitcoin and lost money on that, right? I think it's just it just becomes this whole game of where people think that they can like beat Bitcoin in the long run, and I just don't think it'll happen. So, so I'm trying. Right? I'm, people, I'm, people can try. I'm pointing out to you that. There are other people that are making more money than you in crypto, and I'm, I'm trying to help you understand how the market works because I come from a place of knowledge. I am a trader, and I watch these charts, and I designed my own cryptocurrency. And in order to do that well, I needed to understand everything in the market. So I come from a position of knowledge. You're coming a position of ignorance because you want to be ignorant about these things. And so you're going to get a lot more out of this conversation, this part of the conversation, than I am because I have something to give you here. And I want to share it with you because it's important that you know about the market that you're in and about the competitors that you have that are fighting for investors' money that you would like to see by Bitcoin instead of other things. It's very important that you understand the other sales pitches that they're receiving, the other things that they're buying, and the other things that might have good ideas that you might be able to roll into Bitcoin. You know, you might be able to adopt other ideas from other successful things cryptocurrencies have done and adopt them into Bitcoin. You can only do that from a position of knowledge. So right now, uh, BNB, is at 23,315% over Bitcoin on the BTC pair in 870 days. And this is after it took a pretty good dump. If I measure, so this is 870 days. If I measure it from its actual peak, it's up 48,000%, a shitcoin as you would describe it. So the founders of this shitcoin have more Bitcoin than you'll ever have in your entire life and probably 
all the people you've met in Bitcoin as well, because they've got billions of dollars of Bitcoin. Like they got hacked for $50 million of Bitcoin and it wasn't even any sweat off their balls. They didn't even really mind, right? The plus token Ponzi schemers also own more Bitcoin than you will ever own. They own 1% of the coins. At some point you have to realize that what people are buying and being advertised to and putting all of their economic energy in is not what you have chosen. And you can help influence them and, and influence them into buying better things. I would much prefer people buy Bitcoin than Ponzi schemes. I would much prefer people buy Bitcoin than shitty ICOs for stupid businesses that should never work, right? But every once in a while, something does work and something is better. And this BNB product was an ICO. It had a token launch. It had a token sale. It was an ICO. And now it's up at its peak 48,000% over Bitcoin. And now, you know, what, like, 20, 24,000%. That's a lot of percent, bro. You got to get your head out of the sand, man. I mean, I like, you're a smart right, guy. Here's an alternative I know Let me get that then. So my view is more like there is a complete fire hose of information in this quote unquote True. crypto world. True. It's not easy to necessarily follow these Agree. different uh, called projects yep. and uh, uh, fundamentally you have to take that view of default scam right if sure. you see Agree. something and you have to basically basically have to view that view it from that perspective Agree, 100%. Now, it's true that okay some scammer out there made more bitcoin than a, a person out there will because okay fine they made their own shit coin of course they got rich right i'm not saying this is the way that you will maximize your btc mm -hmm. i'm saying what is the most likely to become the money and what is the most likely to actually be a real tool that people can use to actually liberate themselves from central banking and legal tender laws and so on, all that, all that stuff we mentioned at the start, right? That is fundamentally how I'm viewing this. I'm not necessarily saying, oh, yeah, do this thing and you'll make the most money out of it because yeah. it's well, more about I mean, creating I think... a system that gives people more freedom. And another point I would like to add here is also mm -hmm. that Fundamentally, we have to view it like an overall ecosystem, right? I don't see a lot of like I haven't looked into Hex a huge amount. I'll be honest, right? But it's okay. I, look, haven't, look, I don't. I don't blame I, you for that. There is a million coins going on all the time. That's totally understandable. So one point I would add to that is that we have to look at what is. What is, where, are, where is a lot of the developer resources and time going? Where sure. is a lot of the mindshare going? I agree. And what I can see, I can see a lot of work happening in, in, into Bitcoin, right? Now, yes, you pointed out, and correctly, yes, it takes elite level development to get you know, pull requests into Bitcoin. Yep. Uh, it takes a lot of work, but mm -hmm. it's not just at the direct protocol layer. There are people developing things like wallets and other software sure. and how to run your yeah, I, I used to, I used to software. Yeah, when I first got together. it. Who is going to do that? For hex when they could do that on bitcoin <laughs> and they could help build the overall system around bitcoin again the most liquid cryptocurrency just yeah. spoken about before that's mm -hmm. the most important factor yes I, I agree bitcoin is extremely liquid the most liquid cryptocurrency by far agree and also has the most press about it and it also has uh i love when coin center goes and talks in front of congress i think that's amazing you know i was just speaking to someone that works at uh, one of the primary uh, blockchain development companies in the world of which there's two and he's a very smart guy, and I like him very much, and I think he's done great for digital scarcity. And I, I want Bitcoin to do very well. I want Bitcoin to do amazing things, and I tried very hard to do my best to onboard as many users to Bitcoin as I possibly could. And I found that there are just things that I can't fix in that ecosystem, but I can fix them in other ecosystems. So let's talk about developers, right? What I've noticed is that you, you mentioned points which when you examine them hurt your case, but you don't realize that they hurt your case. So for instance, your statement is that Bitcoin is the best because it has the most developers and they're building all kinds of cool stuff. So let's take a look at that idea. Let's examine that. Okay. Just this little, this one little idea. Do you know how many developers were at uh, the last uh, DevCon 5 for Ethereum? Mm, quality of, sure, there were, sure there would have been plenty. But where they, you know, I would say one Greg Maxwell or one Peter Vola is equivalent yeah. to, you know, more than a hundred of those, those developers. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. So well, I'll continue. More work is being done in ZK Snarks by Dan Robertson 
and people on the Ethereum team, not, not that he is, but more people are doing more cool stuff with a more aggressive roadmap and more funding, and there's more of them, and there's more papers published, and there's more things being used in the wild in the Ethereum ecosystem than in Bitcoin by a very large degree. It's not even, it's not even close to contestable. Like there's, there's not even, even a comparison. Now, you, I would have agreed with you that maybe a year or two ago before all the ZK snark stuff and all this super advanced math shit that they're doing now that I barely understand, like optimistic rollups with fraud proofs and like there's, they're doing shit that is just out of my comprehension. It would take me a week to get caught up um, at like a, a hobbyist level, which is more than enough for most people in cryptography. You know, that, that is the case now. Ethereum has a, a, a stronger roadmap with more people working on it with code in the wild, like running, right? It's just, it's not even a comparison, man. You, you should look at what the definance, the distributed finance is going on in that system. It's crazy. Like when I first heard about DAI, I thought that's oh, stupid, it's never gonna work. It's working great, right? I was wrong, it's working great. And that that is a very cool product that is very useful to people that you will never have on Bitcoin. You're not gonna have any type of stable coin on Bitcoin anytime soon for the reason you don't even have Tether on Bitcoin anymore. It, it left that ecosystem too, right? So I hope Bitcoin does amazing things. I have a huge bag of it. I like the developers. I like the ecosystem. I still say wonderful things about it on stage, but I can't say that it's got better or smarter developers than Ethereum has now. Um, and I, I can't say the roadmaps is good. I can't say the likelihood that if they even had a good roadmap that they'd be able to actually fork it in is, is as likely either. You know, the Ethereum people are a little more friendly. You know, I went into the Ethereum, I, I went into the Ethereum Reddit and I said, hey, hey guys, I want to make a list of everything Ethereum does better than Bitcoin. And the thread fucking died. They didn't even want to do it. They didn't want to be tribal. They didn't want to say bad things about Bitcoin in the fucking Ethereum Reddit. Like if I had made that same thread in the Bitcoin Reddit, like, hey guys, I want to talk about how shitty Ethereum is. Like what does Bitcoin do better than it? It would have been like a fucking front page ad and, and just like had everyone on boarding. And so it was so weird to me that those people operate so differently. Like I'm not... It's a dip. So my point is that like when they come up with a way to improve the ecosystem, it is extremely more likely that it'll be implemented. They're even very likely to remove ASIC mining. Do you know how much better that makes things to get rid of fucking ASICs? It makes things vastly better and vastly more distributed. And you can start onboarding users again from the, from that. the say again. Did you say you don't so agree, with, agree that? with that? You, I think what we is you do agree or don't agree. Yeah. So, I mean, we actually do want a lot of of uh, mining and what we ultimately want theoretically speaking is a digitalization of mining across the different axes so one would be across geography of mining mm -hmm. like where is it done yep. one would be around uh pools right, which you know uh, and there are proposals coming such as Sky and v2 and yep. also around the manufacturer of mining right and i think ultimately I what we want is commoditized a6 yep and that'll be fine decentralization across those three axes what I would suggest. So I agree with all of that. And um, so I, I, I love that we found agreement there because that is the security model. You know, the security model is difference of hash rate and honesty of the participants and no collusion and, and hard to influence that. And if they do get bad and evil, then you can route around them. Like if, if a pool gets bad, people can pull their hash rate and go elsewhere. I support that, right? Um, I think that you're not ever going to have a commoditization of ASICs because of their energy intensity, the advantages to being on a smaller node means that if you're able to mine profitably and more efficiently, then you could be the only person able to do that because you're on a smaller node process. And because there's only two or three fabs in the world that can operate at the smaller node sizes, you never they're always gonna be competing to get Bitcoin ASIC chips mined out of those TSMC factories and Samsung factories uh, instead of GPUs for phones and instead of CPUs for computers. And because of that competition, I think you're always going to find that Bitcoin chips are not commoditized because it's been around for 10 years and we've had, it's, we've had less, it, it, there's been absolutely no progress on that front whatsoever. Companies have come and gone, like Jet, Jet uh, Hash or whatever, just went out of business. The guy, Timo Hanke, that was the guy that wrote ASIC Boost, got the patent on it. His ASIC company went out of business. Uh, you know, n numerous ASIC manufacturers have gone out of business. Butterfly Labs went out of business, et cetera. 
So we haven't seen any type of progress in that area. And I truly don't believe we ever will unless it gets easier to build chip fabs. And in fact, it's getting far harder and it's getting far more expensive to tape out a new chip. So I, I don't think we're ever going to see commoditization of ASICs, which means the best thing we can do is fight them, which is something Monero does. Monero kills ASICs uh, rather often with hard forks by design. And, and Ethereum is trying to kill ASICs now. And I, and I think it would be great if Bitcoin did the same thing. I mean, that can hurt as well because it's again possible. hard forking sure. that often so again this is a, there's a different obviously a different philosophy of thought is like the bitcoin way or like let's try to do what we can to not hard fork and try to maintain the compatibility whereas uh i see you know some of these other coins are trying that idea uh but it's I a trade-off but i mean look with, is... with what bitmain did to bitcoin stabbing it in the back that hard i would very strongly and firmly lean towards getting rid of the ASIC guys, if at all possible. And you'll notice they don't talk to you on Twitter because they're in China. And in China, you can't access Twitter. That's not that good for social consensus. It's also not that good to have all your mining hash rate in China because if the Chinese government says jump, everyone is going to say how high. And that is not good. Over time, I think we can make an argument, though, that it is decentralizing. So Blockstream Mining, they set up a facility in Canada. They're oh, renting God. it out space if people want to set up there. Why and then would there's you a new that? one, uh, I think it's called Layer 1 in uh, oh. Texas, where they are, I think they've raised $50 million on a $200 million total valuation. So again, that's another example where I think it's a time factor. Over time, it will decentralize further. So I, you keep doing this thing where you mention a point that like kills your argument. Blockstream is the second most productive employer of code writers for Bitcoin Core. I know people that work there. I like what they do, but I don't like them offering cloud mining, and I don't like them offering a sidechain for money, and I don't particularly like them defending people that use their sidechains because they make money on it. So when I come out and say that centralization is bad and that counterparties are bad, and that you shouldn't put a middleman with a bank account in between you and the bank, and it's worse. You know, the Blockstream guys go on the other side of that and support that stuff because they license Liquid. That bothers me. It also bothers me that the developers are now in the business of selling you hash rate. That is centralization, and it is bad, and it introduces misincentives and mal incentives, and we shouldn't tempt the dragon with that. And furthermore, it's just goddamn bad fucking marketing. They could have just opened that shit under another brand with another set of directors and not had to have this stupid, easily low-hanging fruit of attack with, hey, the guys that write your code also sell you the mining and also support other things which compete with you. So when people use a liquid sidechain to transact value, they don't have to buy and sell Bitcoin. It reduces Bitcoin's store value use case, right? So like, it I just... That shit's all bad. That, that that line of thought that you mentioned about what's going on with Blockstream, that's worse, not better. <clears throat> I think there's a few things there. So first of all, in terms of code contributions, we are now seeing Square Crypto. There's MIT DCI. There's uh, Chenko Great. Labs. Chaincode's the best. Chaincode's number one. Blockstream's number two. Chaincode's number one. A lot Blockstream's of them... number two. Right. Uh not 100 percent sure on that it actually might be that actually might be a bit lower blockstream okay in terms of bitcoin core that is okay right? and they might I mean, maybe look i haven't now. looked in six That's... or eight months like it may have changed in six or eight months yeah because there are actually a bunch of independent developers so if you look at mm -hmm. um on twitter there's a guy his name's john attack i recently interviewed him on the podcast and mm -hmm. he recently tweeted actually showing out um like commits. So again, Excellent. commits are not indicative of everything, right? But anyway, that's one point, like the mm -hmm. code part. I, I'm, now, I'm happy to see around... more decentralization development. I, I think it's great. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And I, I, again, I think that's, again, we're seeing more and more coming there. Um, so with the liquid, now, I think that is one point where, so you mentioned earlier around how you think that stops Bitcoin's store of valueness, so to mm -hmm. speak. Again, I would disagree with that. I think what we're, actually seeing is more like a, a new settlement layer coming right we're seeing a new market structure rather than the old the, like kind of the traditional model of like custodian and like clearinghouse and exchange that sort of model we might see a newer model and this might be more like a settlement layer uh across the different exchanges i thought, and trading, I thought bitcoin uh, was a settlement desks. layer 
I thought I thought Bitcoin well, was a settlement layer. Too. I think that's so you can't too. have it both ways. Too, I think it's more like you can't have well, it. Well, I think ways. it's more like I think it's more like people will use uh, like liquid for other tokens, right? So okay. and Bitcoin. Look, I'm, Bitcoin I'm okay with security trade-offs. I'm I'm okay with time memory trade-offs. I'm okay with throughput decentralization, censorship resistant trade-offs. I'm okay with a world where people choose what type of trade-offs they want to make and as long as they're honestly disclosed they can use them like i support that right but i want to be clear about the trade-offs that you're making when you use the liquid product they do have a hardware security module and it is proprietary software and i don't think it's open source so if you like a closed source siloed faster but if the devs want to fuck you they can kind of thing you have that cool but how does that pump my bitcoin bag bro because that's what I care about. So, I care about the Bitcoin price. All right. Well, even there, <clears throat> it helps with like arbitrage, right? So if a trader wanted to quickly, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, you know, move money around yep. exchanges, or it also helps to some extent a little bit around the regulatory. So it's like you could argue it's a bit like a, a regulatory arbitrage in mm -hmm. some ways. So someone could set up a liquid CAD, for example, liquid Can Canadian dollar, mm -hmm. yeah, and they could then use that liquid Canadian dollar on the liquid network and then other exchanges can simply support liquid rather than having a Canadian bank account, for example, sure. right? And then right. They're, they're kind of, to some extent mm -hmm. getting around, you know, Canadian AML right. regulation laws a little bit, okay. right? Now, yep. I think that's one thing we'll see with liquid and like to, to the point you were saying earlier around making trade-offs and choosing, right? Mm -hmm. So now obviously not your keys, not your coins with Bitcoin. That's the, you know, that's as Andreas popularized, that's the most important thing so people who really want to hold their bitcoins they should obviously be doing you know multi-signature air gapping all that all that sort of stuff but for not, I, I wouldn't i wouldn't suggest the multi-sig actually because most people will just store their multi-sig in the same place and then it's just more expensive transaction like you can't just suggest I, there have been a lot of companies that have lost money that used multi-sig so like just, anyway i won't i won't go into hard, about key security right now but Right. Yeah. So, right. Um, anyway, the point the point being that if you are that sort of person, if you're like an exchange, you're trusting that two thirds of the liquid functionaries will not screw you over, right? But that's an opt in model. You don't have to use it. Okay. So so just just to and I'm trying to. I I think that you are behaving in ways that you're unaware of with internal discongruence that that you just haven't noticed before. So I try and point them out when I find them. And then maybe six months from now, you'll you'll have like a, a snap, and then things will be congruent again, perhaps. If you can support a wrapped fiat currency, on a if one third wants to fuck you, they can network. It's two which thirds. It appears well. okay, two thirds. If you can support a wrapped fiat currency on a two thirds can fuck you network, then surely you should be able to support that on other networks too, like EOS. EOS used to be able to just seize your coins whenever they wanted, but apparently they got rid of the ECAF or whatever that could do that. And so apparently now it's censorship resistant and fast and all that crap. Okay, well then if they have wrapped fiat there, it should work. We have wrapped Bitcoin inside Ethereum with BitGo as a counterparty. And then you have to choose whether you like BitGo as your counterparty or whether you want the liquid developers as your counterparty, right? Like if you're okay with, with non-maximalism, because it was built by some guys that also just happened to work on Bitcoin, then you really should be okay with other things that fulfill the same stuff with just different developers, right? Like uh, the difference here for me and why I don't think that is being incongruent is again, comes back to what I was explaining earlier around monetary maximalism versus platform maximalism, right? Mm -hmm. I think of Bitcoin and Satoshi's rather as the uh, there's that tendency, as we were saying, the one by one uh, commodities will be rejected until we're left with the most saleable one, right? So from a but, monetary but the market has gone the view, other direction. So you you say that, but then when you look at how many coins exist, it's always more, never less. Well, and Andre, and it's interesting. It's funny you say this because Andreas made a similar kind of argument as well when I was interviewing him. But I think that is like a short term thing, right? Long term. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. Why would you think that it would stop? But, but also, oh, this isn't this, this isn't just happening to Bitcoin. It's happening to Ethereum too. Of course, 
lot of people will try it. Hey, a sucker is born every minute. As the no, but we already says, had right? we already had the bear market. We already had the negative ninety per five percent in the alts, man. Like that shit already happened, and there's still new ones, and they're still doing new stuff. And Ethereum's market cap is not appreciating as quickly as the ERC twenties on Ethereum. Look at how many multi-billion dollar tokens Ethereum has launched. BNB, that's up hundreds of times over Bitcoin, was launched on Ethereum. TRX, multi-billion dollar coin, or 1.5 billion, something like that, launched on ERC-20. USDT, more transactions than any other crypto. Multi-billion dollar coin, launched on ERC-20, or launched on Omni, but it does the majority of the transactions now on ERC-20. You know, how many different top 10 cryptos do you need to see launch as the RC20s and they all plug in with each other? It's like Legos for finance, right? So you like interoperability, you like no order books, you like no counterparty risk. All of this distributed finance stuff plugs right in with each other. That's the future, man. This silo of like, yo, I just like Bitcoin and I just like this one product which almost no one uses, maybe a couple exchanges and maybe a couple big traders with arbitrage maybe they use it that's like you're locked into that when the whole rest of the world like you're locked into aol and the whole rest of the world's working on the real financial internet basically but mm, but you don't so, you don't see that yet so i would say it's more like we have to get the money right first and i think a lot of these other projects fundamentally are well they're probably just too early right and they need to be we have to kind of get the money yeah. changed right and get XRP that has a lower inflation rate than Bitcoin. XLM well, has a lower inflation rate than Bitcoin. As a matter of fact, XLM again, just these... cut its fucking supply. It's like market supply almost in half. So like if you right, well, so if you if you <laughs> like if you say you got to get the money right, I can point to you other coins that are kind of getting the money right better from the inflation. But are they getting the money right first? Do they have the same buy support? No. Well, here's don't. So well, here's what I know. XLM used to not be in the top ten, and now they are, and they just gave me another free bunch of that shit today for being a Keybase user. So I'm getting free fucking money for XLM that is free, and Bitcoin didn't give me any okay, free money today. Oh man, like that's like twenty dollars or whatever it is. Like, is that gonna really? Yeah, like move every the couple months they give me like fifty off? bucks for nothing. I never fucking do anything. I just right. Nothing. So the whole world is gonna adopt XLM because they got fifty dollars on Keybase. Is that really I'm, what you're thinking? I'm telling about? you that if you held Bitcoin, Bitcoin. <laughs> I'm telling you the likelihood that you 10x your net worth in Bitcoin is a shitload lower then you 10x your net worth and some of those other coins on their way up to the top 10 or top 20. That's just the math of it. It takes more play, economic play energy. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes though. I think well, that you're, you're, you're putting how people much? do, people try that, they're putting themselves at risk of sure. basically just losing a lot of but money. But it's fucking free. It's free, man. You ain't risking shit, bro. It's free. It's fucking free. Okay, so even, if it, even that's a free ride though, you might actually, now I didn't claim my XLM, I didn't bother, but you, could theoretically <laughs> if you thought well bitcoin is more marketable and long term better you might trade that in for bitcoin and then hold bitcoin instead sure go ahead but at least take the free fucking money i mean uh, dude xrp xlm bch bsv four top 10 cryptos all fucking free and when i mine bitcoin free how much like free is fucking good like it's all up in the top 10 bro you should like that shit you should. You would have. It like, just ends up being distraction, though. But hey, look. Ultimately, if you wanna, you know, you can do that. I, I would not. Uh, for me, I focus more on what I think is gonna make a meaningful difference in the world. Okay. And I think. Do you think Libra? Do you think Libra would onboard more users than Bitcoin? Uh, so this is a like. I mean, it depends who you ask, right? This is one of those questions where. You know, some people say, oh, yeah, look, all these people might use it and then it'll be an onboarding into Bitcoin and it'll be better. And, you know, and then the other angle might be, hey, they might not even launch, right? They may never even get the permission and the regulatory rights to actually launch. So why be, why even bother with all this? Well, right? here's the funny thing is that, like, they don't need permission. They're just being nice about it. They don't need permission at all. Building a cryptocurrency well, is permissionless. I mean, the government could try and shut Facebook down or something like that, right? I why mean, would and the now, government ask fuck Facebook but not Bitcoin? <laughs> like, come on. Those guys have lobbyists. A lot of them. B the government would ask fuck Bitcoin long before they would ask fuck Facebook because all of those little politician guys really like their Facebook page. 
So like, I, I, I gotta tell you, like if, if, uh, if Facebook started charging $20 a week to use it, every politician would bust their credit cards out and pay for that Facebook page immediately. Um, yeah. Well, they want so, the reach to even uh, more cynically, <laughs> Facebook might have uh, blackmail material on the politicians. So well, who knows, I right? I, I don't, yeah. so I'm just saying, I, mean, who knows, I, right? I, I wanna make an impact in the world. I wanna make the world a better place. And I think peer to peer, trustless, no order book, no bullshit scam wicks, no margin trading and getting fucking liquidated, no uh, fees. That's amazing. And I built something that does all of that shit and I'm giving it to you for free. But a Bitcoin signature you can do offline, anonymous as fuck. As a matter of fact, you might not have possession of your keys right now. And I might be convincing you, or I'm pretty sure you do, but a lot of Bitcoin guys don't. And me, Offering them something for free, if they take possession of their own finances and take responsibility for them, reduces the number of people that lose money to getting hacked in exchange. Reduces the number of people that realize, oh shit, my backup's not actually here. So I better like re-save my keys, right? I'm doing a lot to actually improve Bitcoin security by getting people to make sure their keys are in their own possession, just like Trace Meyer's trying to do with proof of keys, except Trace Meyer's not paying you, but Hex is paying you to make sure you have your own keys. That's better, not worse. You know, I see I see one of these uh, maxi pads in the channel here talking about you're going to dox yourself to Richard Hart. Man, your your doxing information isn't worth anything to me. I can't sell it. it. Has no economic value. It's a fucking liability. I don't want it. Right. I don't want to have GDPR responsibilities for you. I don't want your data. I don't want to know where you're from. I don't want to be asked questions about you. I don't give a shit. I want to give you free stuff. And actually, when I say I'm going to give it to you, really, you're minting your own coins running software that you chose and doing your own transactions. So I'm not really giving you anything. You're running your own software, making your own coins in a peer-to-peer -peer network. And I'd like to see you do that. <clears throat> yeah, I hope, I hope that I, I hope that something well, that I told you was of value to you. I, I think I expressed a lot of things that you may not have known that that may help you pump your bags in Bitcoin harder. You know, I think. There's a lot of people have to do good stuff. I think of it more like from a total addressable market point of view, we're talking about Bitcoin is going after global money. Like that's what mm -hmm. this thing is, in, mm -hmm. in my view. That's what I think this thing is going to cool. be. Uh, obviously, I could be wrong, right? But I think that's essentially what it's as I agree with Trace Mayer on this point. I think it, the world is deciding is it going to be Bitcoin or USD or gold, right? It's going to be one of those three, like in all likelihood. Now, I believe it'll be most likely Bitcoin, but what, what China? I so, like, China's not, China's not even in the fucking game. Like, fuck China. What are you talking about? Come on, man. No, I don't a couple billion people end. there, mate. They just think... all end blockchain. Well, they just all end it. Well, They're teaching sure, in school to the kids I now. Think... <laughs> I think They're so. Player. I think USD is still still the world's reserve currency. In inertia around that. So from a fiat point of view, it's USD. But from a crypto point of view, it's Bitcoin. That's how I'm doing it. Yeah. I think people who want to play other games, you know, it's it's ultimately, as I said, and the safe scene says, or as other people say, yeah. it's a place to be games when stupid prices. That's I, I think. I think I can onboard millions of users to X is what I think I can do without a single dollar of marketing. We've got 22,000 signups on the email list, had a dev lose 4,000 of them. He's no longer with us. Got 18,500 today. I think <clears throat> left. Uh, maybe some people got my notice a couple of days ago that they should like, you know, make sure their email address is in there. Um, and we've got, 4,500 people in the chat room, real humans. Bot kicks out all the other bots, right? Starts everyone muted, like bans people on the CAS list and all these things. I've got more memes, more new users, and more traction in the bubble that I live in, which is mostly the Bitcoin bubble, to tell the truth, than Bitcoin does. And I was just at a talk in Malta. I was just in a talk in Singapore. And I saw what everyone was promoting and everyone was talking about. And Bitcoin was about 10% of it. So... If, if like you're dreaming big dreams, you're saying big words, you do have the liquidity now, but you do not have the most developers. You do not have the smartest developers. Maybe they're tied with ETH because of the ZK Snarks guys. Look it up. You do not onboard the most new users. Ponzi schemes are winning that game. As far as press and the media goes, Libra took all that for a good while. And now China's taking all that. And what they're advertising is blockchain, not Bitcoin, unfortunately. And if they're not doing that now, they will do it because they oscillate between ban, unban, ban, unban, just to fucking rape all the traders for some reason. It's hilarious. I actually made a gif of it on a roller coaster. Ban, unban. 
It's crazy how they do it. And they space it out over time. They won't just get it all over with. They make sure that it comes out, you know, over like like you did when the when the Panama Papers came out or when uh, the Snowden revelations came out. You know, if you want to have maximum media impact, you space it over over time. Same reason I don't release all my videos the same day. Well, they do that in China too with their good news, bad news blockchain cycle. It's infuriating, unless you're ahead of the game on it. <clears throat> so I think that a lot of other currencies are doing thing amazing, doing things amazingly well. Referral program is super powerful. It's working for all the Ponzi's. It's working for Amazon. It's working for Tesla. And Bitcoin doesn't have one, right? B uh, developer meetups where on DevCon four there was twenty five hundred developers there. How many developers can get a Bitcoin developer meetup? Three, eight. 14. A uh, Bitcoin developer meetup? Well, it depends yeah. where. Like, if you're talking about bid devs in New York or San mm -hmm. Francisco, you will get a solid turnout there. Uh, and well, there are now uh, other like similar 30? meetups starting around the It can't be more than 30. The other point I would also want to point out as well is, again, long-term uh, thinking here. Because, mm -hmm. again, who's going to trust in Hexcoin for the long term when there, there's already Bitcoin, which has this already existing architecture and structure around it? And... The other point you like, because I think you were trying to say this idea of like, oh, free transactions, blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. who's to say that would stay that way, right? Like, oh, it could get very expensive. Bro, sure. Floats, right? Yeah, it could, it could get very expensive. Right? And then I'd have to stop saying that. Yep. But I think if I think if transactions on Hex got expensive, I think Bitcoins would be vastly higher. I think whatever ecosystem causes Hex to have expensive transactions will also cause Bitcoin transactions to be even more expensive, which makes sense because... You're, you're trying to secure more value with a higher market cap, so why wouldn't the transactions be more expensive on that? Network, I agree right? that transaction <laughs> fees will rise on Bitcoin, and mm -hmm. I think that's that will just be viewed yeah. as part of the security model. So do we? So did we make? Bitcoin are comfortable with that? They've yeah. accepted that longer term transaction fees on chain will rise. If you want more security, they have to. Like. Yeah, essentially. You know, like the security is related to how much the miners make. But I, I I believe it's a little misleading because. In Bitcoin, we have had critical failures, and they have not been hash rate failures. We've never had a hash rate failure in Bitcoin. We've had right. software yes, failures. Arguably, actually, Bitcoin has maybe you could argue that actually it's got too much security right now. Yeah, right? and we need to spend and more on devs and less on fucking hash rate. But we can't change the game because it's set in stone or close enough. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and so I just think of it like, well, hey, it's it's what works now, and uh, over time it will rise over time because I, my view is fundamentally bullish on Bitcoin, and I think fundamentally you are also. I'm bullish full, on Bitcoin I am also well. bullish on Bitcoin, and I think the price is going to so, go up, and the adoption is going to go up. And look, if the price is this good, and we have such little adoption, imagine if we got more adoption, how price, how high the price would go. You know, like I, I am bullish on Bitcoin. I just think that I can get people higher ROI with better security in something I can give them for free and pay the evil miners less and like and get rid of the whales and penalize them 75 percent and get rid of like there's so many good things i can do and incentives i could structure by designing a smart contract that that i can't do in bitcoin you know i think one way maybe one other fundamental difference in our views here is also that idea of um if you uh, you might be familiar with frederick hayek right so he a little bit there's one um passage i think he wrote i can't remember the exact book but he wrote about something like basically think th a product of human action but not of human design right so fundamentally you're coming at it from this frame of oh i can design and i can architect mm -hmm. and i can do these little things that will mm -hmm. make it all better and yep. i'll note also that you put in a few little populist rhetoric things in there as well like sure. oh, screw the whales right like so you yeah. kind of you're but then i actually screw that, them too right? yes yeah, right? so i use the well, rhetoric and then i actually like actually screw them as well Right. So I, I, well, I, I think my rhetoric is good. I, I do frame things well. And, you know, like, I think everyone should try to do that. Right. I mean, look, that's a that's a fundamentally, you know, political act and so on. Right. But anyway, the framing aside, the point I'm making is that fundamentally, Bitcoin is a product of human action. And it's not so consciously designed in the way that you're kind of approaching Hex. That's that's, I think, one of the fundamental differences in our view between yours and mine that i think it it, it it has to be viewed from that kind of zoomed out long-term perspective right and so when people like andreas say oh look look at all these new shit coins that are coming out you must be wrong about this idea of maximalism because oh look at all the shit coins coming well I, from my point of view of course of course there's going to be a ton of shit coins coming out i just think they're not going to win against bitcoin because they don't have the same characteristics what do, what do you think that guys that made eight track tapes were saying 
when they had the entire market and the cassette tape came out? What do you think it was like in their boardroom meetings? I yeah, you know, cassettes point. are smaller, but I mean, we've already got the manufacturers. They already install our machines. People are used to it, right? You go I to the store, there's network no cassettes for sale. It's only tracks. But I then think monetary network is far stronger. And then also any of these projects that have come out, they might have, even if for some technical reason, they had something that was technically interesting, they at best were like only marginally half better in some one thing, but they weren't better overall on the whole of Bitcoin. And I, I would say the same about any of these other coins. I, I like Bitcoin, I own it, but I also know it went down 85 and Dogecoin went down 95 and Dogecoin didn't get rolled back. And Dogecoin works fine and it's just a fork of Bitcoin. So if you like back, if you like Bitcoin back then when it forked, then you should like it fucking now. Well, and you know I what else is a fork of Bitcoin? Everything Dogecoin else. comparison isn't really a good one because there wasn't. It's not like there was real commerce happening on Dogecoin's chain, right? It's not that the. It's not that like. Okay, it's worth like a quarter from, like, billion dollars. Meme, it's worth like a quarter million dollars. Aside from like bro. little meme level commerce on it, and, like people doing joke trades on it, it had nothing compared to Bitcoin. And m the problems that come with some of these cryptocurrencies are problems that come with scale. So it's easy to kind of like have these little. Uh, you know, shit coins that make certain trade-offs now but, and have more transactions now. But it's just now, Bitcoin, bro. Then you're making they don't fun of Bitcoin. actually long-term scale. Yeah, but you're making fun of Bitcoin now. All that coin no. is is a fork of Bitcoin from the past. It's just Bitcoin from the past. You're making fun of Bitcoin from the past. You, like, no, it's not Bitcoin. All of these. There is only it one is. Bitcoin. It's the same fucking code. It has there the is same... only one Bitcoin. Okay. <laughs> Listen. That's you may not believe that other, Bitcoin. listen, if I forked Bitcoin right now and no one 51% attacked it, it would work pretty fucking good because it's good software. It, you know, would it be Bitcoin though? No, but it doesn't have to be. It, it, what? Everything doesn't have to be the number one fucking thing. You know, it's, it's okay to own a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or a fucking Tesla. It's okay to own any of those three things. It's okay to read a fiction book or a nonfiction book or a porno mag. It's all fine to do all that shit. Like, it's not okay for you to think that like you have to all in Bitcoin so hard that you can't use something that gives you real privacy like Monero. It's not okay for you to think that you live in a silo where no one wants to interact with you. And if they try to, you literally screw them with opcode changes. Like they screwed XRP or rather XCP counterparty by making the opcodes, you know, smaller and harder to write and all this shit. And they had to change a million things to try and still operate on that ecosystem because you tried to kill them off because they tried to build on your ecosystem while the whole rest of the world wants to interop with your, uh, interoperate with each other. Like there's, there's a whole world of amazing things going on in finance right now that you, you're just mute to because all you see is like, oh, maybe I'll get Mimblewimble, maybe I'll get Schnorr signatures, and maybe I'll get Lightning. You got anything else on your roadmap? If you got something else on your roadmap, I want to be enlightened and I want to be excited and I want to feel good about my Bitcoin bags. So let me know what I'm getting that's not Schnorr, Mimblewimble, which just got shown today to be pretty useless. And uh, Lightning, what do you got? Now, mind you, it's been two years since well, you got Segwit. I think Schnorr and Lightning are really awesome today. And, you know, Schnorr, once we get that, then... Theoretically, we can get stuff like L2 as well, which is the new formulation of Lightning Network. On top of that, later down the track, we may eventually get signature aggregation as well, which may even make coin joining cheaper than the standard transaction, right? I now, that's a way off. That we may never get it. But I hope we get all I that stuff. It fundamentally but can we admit that these are not like world, like these are maybe 10% improvements? I mean, it's good. So like, I would say if we get if we get L2, potentially we can get channel factories, or in the general case, known as multi-party channels. That okay. would also dramatically help people use Lightning Network because okay. then we can start doing channel factories. And so sure. that would be a huge game changer. All but right. I think even if we don't get that, I think we get like a thirty percent. Then I would say that like makes Bitcoin thirty percent better. Then which is a lot. It's a lot. You know, one hundred sixty billion dollar market cap, one hundred fifty, thirty percent better. It's like an extra fifty billion. Yeah, I'm excited about that. I think you'll find the stuff in Ethereum is like more outrageous and more crazy. Like optimistic rollups, 100x the throughput right now on chain. Uh, ZK snarks, anonymity, getting rid of paying the miners anything at all with proof of stake. Um, there's a lot of lottery tickets to a lot of amazing things in that ecosystem. Um, and there's just more people working on it with better funding. You should look into it, man.
it's pretty neat and it's already launched uh, all the other you know what three or four of the other top 10 cryptos you should learn about it Andreas did as a matter of I, fact you know I'm the reason I'm on this talk with you right now the reason I'm on this talk with with you right now is because I heard your Andreas talk and he had a very similar conversation as to the one I'm having with you as regards to how maximalism isn't really all there is and how Ethereum's pretty cool. So it's like, I heard the Andreas talk and I figured I would give you round two of the same thing, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's what it ended up being. Um, but I guess, look, I, it's probably a good time to end it now. Yeah. I guess we've yeah, sort of, we've good. spoken it out. Um, we covered a lot been, of stuff. Obviously we happy disagree. With it. Yeah, but it's fine. Yeah, obviously we disagree, but I think, um, yeah, that I mean, you've got your view, I've got mine. Uh, it, was, the market. Uh, it was a good chat. So, and so let me ask you this. It's got something out of it. Yep. Before we go, definitely we're both going to show all our stuff so that the people that are watching can derive more value from us in the future. Um, let's let's have a little, not a bet, but like, you know, a little prediction thing. So my coin snapshot is set in like 12 days. And then the contract launches the next day. And then the staking launches the next day. So we're going to know whether my shit sucks or not within some pretty short time frame, right? So how would you know if my shit didn't suck? Like what metric would you use to measure it? Well, I think we can't really look at these things on a short time frame. I would, okay. I would really look at more like long term. How is it done in right. say five years from today? You know, so you, that's so how you, I would. So you understand that if ever anything cool actually does happen, you won't know about it until five years later using that worldview. And maybe that's a, a conservative but safer worldview. Okay. All right. Because I thought it would be cool to be like, yo, if, you, if we hit this metric, then you'll think we're cool. You know, like if we onboard this many users, or if we do this much transaction volume, or if we lock up this amount of money, or, you know, some kind of measurable thing where you could go, oh, you know, that, that worked. You know, I thought that would be cool. But you, know, you can't think maybe, of anything. I, I, would, I would want to look at it more in a long term time frame. So, and yeah, I, I, maybe that's closing me off. Maybe I'm, uh, closed off uh, ideologically or whatever, but I think longer term, I think this viewpoint works better for me. Uh, but you know, you're welcome well, imagine, to your imagine, views as well. Imagine how much it cost fiat maximalists when they ignored Bitcoin the way you're ignoring everything else. And they had to wait until think, five years later to a, buy it 2014 at $1,300. Yeah. So that's a category error. That's a category error. Like from, okay. from my point of view, I think it's more like Bitcoin really was a big difference. Whereas mm -hmm. I think Hex is more just like, a, more of a in the grand scheme it's more like a little kind of distraction sideshow thing i right? would, I would not, agree with you yeah. i would agree with you on that that they are different categories however the people that bought ethereum which launched far after bitcoin launched made a 4300x in three and a half years and made a better return than bitcoin holders did coulda so woulda I, shoulda i i never i had an opportunity as well i mean i was around bitcoin i just never really paid much attention to ethereum and i was always kind of skeptical of it and yeah, sure. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. Maybe don't, I would have more Bitcoin. Don't make the same mistake again, bro. Choose winners and losers. But, don't just assume you can never choose another winner. You chose one winner. It was Bitcoin. It's very likely you could choose another if you read up on stuff, right? I think you could do it. I think that there are better or worse coins, and you can learn what better ones look like and participate. It doesn't have to be a large portion of your stack. You know, a lot of people, Trace Meyer tells people they should have you know a certain percentage. I think it's a single digit percentage. I think I've heard him say 1%, but you know, look it up and check it. I think he says everyone should have at least 1% of their portfolio in Bitcoin, because what if it does take over, right? Well, maybe you should look at other coins like that from your Bitcoin stack. Like maybe I don't want to miss the next Ethereum. Maybe I should put 1% of the things I think are okay, or so scammy that you would feel bad if they went up and you know they'll go up because people are stupid. <laughs> like, well, I say pretty, pretty like, look, here's the thing, right? For some people, they might, if you give that as a suggestion to people, then they might start going, oh, 1% into this shit coin, oh, 1% into another shit coin, and pretty soon it's all added up, and now That's how Bitcoin got me. Down. Bitcoin gave me the freemium, and then I bought in. That's how they got me. That's how they got a lot of Ethereum guys, too, with the, the GP money. Dude, I, I've enjoyed this talk. Like, I, I thought that uh, once your internet cleaned up, uh, we talked about only smart stuff, and I think you represented the maximalist... Uh, Austrian economics, von Mises, uh, von you know Hayek, like I, I think you represented all those guys' uh, views very well, and uh, you know I, I don't think anyone else could have had a better maximalist, non-maximalist conversation than we had. So it was really the best we could do, I think. Yeah, thank you very much, Richard. Thanks for having me it's on been the show. It's a pleasure, bro. If you if you think 
that any of your followers oh we should show our stuff so tell uh how can people find you yeah sure so uh yes yeah, so my website is stefanlevera.com and i've also got for listeners who would like to learn more about how to in their own full node and so on ministryofnodes.com.au so they're the two i would list for that for for the listeners all right uh, i link to his uh, twitter in the uh the notes here underneath the uh, video i'm richard hart <laughs> I'll do my shilling round here. I'm Richard Hart. I've got about 100,000 followers across uh, YouTube and Twitter. I've got uh, a free price calls channel called Richard's Calls. It's got like 8,500 members in it. You shouldn't trade. You'll probably lose your money. But if you must, you can go to richardhart.win and margin trade away 100x. But you probably shouldn't. Uh, two, I've got a trading channel, Strape Charts, t.me forward slash Strape Charts. Once again, you probably shouldn't trade. I've got a you know general crypto chat. Used to be mostly Bitcoin maximalist. It's probably still mostly Bitcoin maximalist. T.me forward slash Strape, like strawberry grape. I wrote a couple self-help books. I believe the best thing we can do in the world is uh, work on biology and heal human beings. And it's called SciVive, like survive through science. T.me forward slash SciVive. The books are free. You can download them. They're an outline format, so you're going to get a lot of things to do that are awesome without the narrative glue. When the narrative glue there, we'll publish them. But Hex first, SciVive next. I've got uh, Hex.win, which if you want an extra 10% free coins, you can go to pumpamentals.com. And uh, it's a world's first blockchain CD free for Bitcoin holders. And uh, it's got two security audits, one mathematics audit. You can see the code uh, on the website. Or if you want to see the super, super, super you know, in-depth code and look at the commit history, you can go to the GitLab. And I can add you to the GitLab. Just message me t.me forward slash Richard Hart. No spaces, spelled like the heart in your chest. If you want to follow me on YouTube, it's youtube.com forward slash Richard Hart. If you want to follow me on Twitter, which you should do, it is twitter.com forward slash Richard Hart win. If you want to donate to charity, you should donate to sens.org. They accept crypto. Uh, it turns out if you cure cancer, people only live three years longer on average, even though it kills 40% of people. If you cure heart disease, uh, even though that also kills 40% of people, uh, you only live three years longer. Well, why don't we work on technology that can get us four years? It's worth. It's better than curing something that kills 40% of all people. And that's what SENS.org works on, regenerative medicine. Um, I think that's it. Free price calls, free chat, free books, free tokens, and a charity. I think that's... Uh, if you want to look at Hex shirts, they're not for sale. I haven't turned the billing on, but the site's built out. If you just want to see what kind of stuff will eventually be available when I feel like fielding all the customer service calls from where's my shirt, um, hexshirt.com. And that's it. Uh, Stefan, it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. I wish uh, great, great things in the Bitcoin ecosystem, and I hope the price goes to the absolute moon. Um, you know, I've got a big bag of it. I'm not sure how big my bag right. will be after Hex launches, but right now I've got a big bag. <clears throat> <laughs> All right. Well, great. Well, uh, pleasure chatting with you, Richard, and uh, thanks for hosting me. Pleasure, man. Talk to you.